Whether you're joining a product marketing alliance event for the first time, or if you're a seasoned regular, welcome to the second edition of the Customer Marketing Summit. Before we dive into the day's content, we just wanna say a huge thank you to our sponsors, partners, speakers, and you, our lovely audience. From wherever you're watching in the world, we're sure you'll enjoy the sessions from our incredible lineup. With expert presentations, specialist talks, and deep dive panel sessions on the agenda, you are in for a real treat today. To get the most out of these sessions, please ensure you are sharing your feedback and asking all your questions in the comments section, and our speakers will be answering them throughout the day. After the event, a great place to continue the conversation is in the customer marketing channel in the PMA Slack community. If you aren't already a member, hop on over and come and join the discussion. And if that's still not enough, then why not become a PMA Pro member and benefit from unlimited access to exclusive templates, frameworks, and our entire library of videos and slide decks from all our events. So with all that to come, let's dive right into the next session. Hi everyone, and welcome to Prioritizing Personas as an investment in building a comprehensive lifecycle framework. My name is Adria Fisher, and I'm the Director of Customer Marketing at Sovos, a leader in the tax and regulatory compliance industry. Sovos is a global company specializing in solutions for the complexities of digital tax transformation with complete and connected offerings for tax determination, continuous transaction control, tax reporting, and more. You can learn more by visiting sovos.com. So I've been working in marketing for over 15 years and I've had the good fortune to work at some really great companies, including Time Warner Cable, Comcast, WGBH, which is the Boston PBS station, as well as Kronos, which is now UKG, before joining Sobos half a year ago. So I've held a variety of roles in marketing, including program management, customer reference management, competitive intelligence, and product marketing before joining the ranks of customer marketing about four years ago. So I've enjoyed all of those roles thoroughly, but I found my place when I joined customer marketing for sure. It's been a wonderful journey for my career so far, and I'm loving the growth that's happening in this field. Uh, there are so many opportunities, so it's a really exciting time for anybody who wants to learn more or pursue this area. So this session emphasizes that the key to engaging customers is an investment in developing robust and dynamic customer personas, specifically focusing on how your personas interact with your business, your product, or your service, as well as how they engage, knowing what they need, and more importantly, why they matter. So I believe that it's the role of the customer marketer to gather insights and extrapolate why each persona matters, because they all do whether that persona is an end user or a decision maker. Knowing your personas, continuously researching, um, interviewing and validating your personas is essential to developing meaningful and relevant multi-channel content. It also ensures that the content you create is going to resonate and you're delivering the right message to the right person at the right time using the right tactics. So one of the first projects I undertook when I transitioned to customer marketing was developing my company's customer personas. I didn't know it at the time, but it would become a pivotal project in my career because as time went by, my name became increasingly associated with the customer persona work that I'd done. And I was often brought into conversations to provide guidance for how to use them as well as approach by other customer facing teams who wanted to learn more. Ultimately, I was called in as the SME when it came to the organization's customer personas. Moreover, doing the research and analysis to develop the customer personas laid the groundwork for validating future decisions around release readiness, event strategies, and many other programs. So it was a solid understanding of the customer personas that enabled my team at the time to create segmented programs, compelling delighters, and more tailored learning paths at user events which provided greater value and more relevant content. All right, so on today's agenda, first I wanna break down what may have drawn you to attend the session in the first place, personas. We're gonna get into what are personas, what are the different types of personas and how they are used, and more importantly, why they matter. 
Then I'll share guidance on how you can get started on creating your own customer personas, and we'll discuss how you can embed them into the customer journey and life cycle. Then we'll wrap up with some tips on how to ensure your customer personas stay relevant and become a priority at your organization. By the end of this session, I hope you walk away with an understanding of the different types of personas, as well as how customer and buyer and user personas differ, as well as why customer personas matter. Additionally, you should leave the session with a plan for how to get started on either creating customer personas from scratch, as well as tips for how to keep your customer personas relevant and a priority. Finally, I hope you start thinking of new ways and ideas for how you can leverage your personas ac across the customer lifecycle. So, a persona is defined as a fictional character created to represent a user type that might use a site, brand, or product in a similar way. Personas are used to consider the goals, desires, and limitations of buyers and users to help guide decisions about a business's service, product, or interaction. Simply put, the purpose of any persona, be it buyer, user, or customer, is to help you understand that persona's needs, experiences, behaviors, and goals. Additionally, I advocate for making the distinction between all three types of personas within your organization because they each serve their own purpose. Buyer personas are going to be focused on pain points or daily frustrations and challenges, as well as what type of information um, they lean on during the buying process. And of course, buyer personas are an important tool for how to effectively position your solution or service during the buying stage of the life cycle. Um, and then, of course, once a buyer purchases the product or service, they become a, a customer. Um, so I've seen confusion around user and customer personas. After all, a customer uses the solution or service, so why would they not simply be a user persona? Um, generally, user personas are created by user experience or user research teams for design and engineering purposes whereas customer personas are a tool that should be created and employed by marketing, specifically customer marketing. So user personas as created by a user experience team often get into demographic details like age, type of employment, level of education, income, hobbies, and interests, etc. So as one director of UX explained to me years ago, the details matter for user personas because they're a tool for engineers who may benefit from a better understanding of the person who is going to be on the receiving end of their coding and design. Simply put, user personas are a means to humanize why feature X matters or why button A should be located where it is. So then we have customer personas, which focus on how customers interact with the solution, the product, or even the business, as well as how they engage what they need, and most importantly, why they matter to your company or organization. Finally, customer personas matter because a lot of customer marketing is focused on communicating the right information to the right person at the right time in the right way. To properly share relevant information with the appropriate audience, we need to first identify who that audience is, what information they need to consume, why they need to consume it, and when it's the best time to communicate that information to them. Customer personas help us align the correct information with the correct person, so communications and content are meaningful, tailored, and timely. Well-developed personas are foundational for creating segmented and personalized communications, programs, and content that resonate and are impactful. All right, let's assume that I've managed to convince you that you need to develop and create customer personas. Perhaps you've been using the buyer personas that product marketing created or the user personas that someone handed you when you first joined customer marketing. And within the last few minutes, you slammed your fist down and said, no more, I'm not gonna stand for this. I need the right tools to be the best, best customer marketer I can be. And I'm gonna start by developing a set of customer personas. So generally speaking, there are four steps to get started as with any project, identify, research, analyze, and then turn your work into a usable tool. And before we part ways, I'm going to give you some tips on how you can keep your customer personas current and become a priority for your organization and a key component during planning. So start by identifying your customer personas. If you're starting from scratch, I highly recommend partnering with someone on your operations team who has full access to your customer database and knows how to create or pull reports. 
Uh, even better if they're an Excel wizard and can help you categorize and segment the various data points. A good place to start is with pulling job title and function or department. Um, another place to start is having a conversation with your sales engineering or your sales teams to find out who they present, do, present to during demonstrations. Um, sales engineers or pre-sales often use demo scripts based on which role and user type they're presenting to during the buying cycle. Um, this team is a great resource to better understand which departments and job functions matter after that buying decision, the state, buying decision stage. Another good starting place is to pull together all the personas that exist across your organization, including buyer and user personas. Um, from there, you can categorize and start identifying. Um, it's equally important to look for the gaps. Um, it's possible that there's a persona that hasn't been accounted for because they only interact with one department um, or are only involved in one stage of the life cycle. Additionally, you might find um, that you've identified some personas that are overlays. So at my last company, we had a persona that one of my wonderful colleagues coined the data ninja. Um, this was a persona that could have been um, just as easily a manager or uh, an administrator for the system, or even a decision maker. It was all about somebody who just loved data and reporting and had very little to do with maybe what their day-to-day -day, uh, role was and how they interacted with um, the solution in the business. Step two is research. By this time, you should have a good idea of how many personas you have, as well as who your customer personas are. But what do you know about them? It's time to do the research. And interviewing is a great way to do this. So obviously start by listing all the questions you want to ask. So for example, when I have done interviews with customers at Sovos, these are some of the questions that I start with. I want to know how do you interact with your Sovos solution? You know, are you a user? Are you a consumer, et cetera? Um, do you engage with or consume? How do you engage with or consume content from Sovos? I will also prompt and give some examples if that helps, like webinars, newsletters, et cetera. I also want to know what do they need to learn to become a better user of their Sovo solution. I also like to ask how they like to engage in their professional life. Are there certain um, social media tools, for example, that they're more willing to use in their professional life versus their personal life? Um, and so a few other questions about what kind of information they prefer to receive and what their priorities are. So if your list of interview questions adds up to 20 um, or more, it's a really good idea to start with a person you know who's going to accommodate your long list. Uh, if you can find one of your personas within your organization or your inner personal circle, um, this is a perfect entry point to formulate and test your interview questions. Moreover, starting with peers or colleagues helps you refine that list of interview questions. It's better to learn which questions don't garner that much information or even feel redundant with a person who's going to be patient with you versus a customer whose time you might want to use more wisely. So, for example, in my last role, we had identified the IT administrator as one of the customer personas. I happen to be married to a person who has worked in IT his entire career, so he was my first interview. And that interview helped me figure out the best way to phrase questions in order to gather the most insight and information. I also reached out to coworkers who worked in the same departments as our customer personas. For example, if your customer is in payroll, human resources, finance, or the legal department, there's a good chance you have a colleague you can interview. And I bet they're going to give you a lot of great information and insight because it might be one of the few times that someone's coming to ask them what they want to know about from their vendors. What information do they want to receive? Um, so here are some additional words of wisdom from my college journalism professor. Never underestimate the power of being silent during an interview. Interviews are about the person you seek information from and are an opportunity for them to share their story and experience. Listen carefully and let them speak. Resist the urge to complete their sentence or finish their thought or even jump in when they pause. A pause just means they wanna give you the most thoughtful response possible. Also, I highly recommend creating an interview template so you're consistent with each interview. And if others on your team are handling interviews, everyone is working off of the same script. You're also going to want to save your interview notes in a shared repository or some type of folder. Uh, trust me when I tell you that you'll want to reference them from time to time.
All right, step three is to analyze. By the end of step one, you have the shell or skeleton of your persona. So now it's time to start adding the guts. Having multiple complete interviews for each persona is gonna be critical to create thoughtful and comprehensive analysis. During your interviews, you're gonna to start to see trends and similarities for how your distinct customer personas interact with your products or services, how they prefer to receive and, con and consume information, as well as what kind of information they care about. So you know you'll have well-developed personas and distinct customer personas when you can answer these questions. How does this persona interact with our product or solution? How does this persona prefer to engage with us? What does this persona need to know? And if you can answer all of those questions, then you're on your way to knowing and understanding why that persona matters. And finally, step four is to convert your research and analysis into a tool that you can reference and makes your customer personas tangible. Give them the same treatment that's been given to your buyer and user personas in terms of presentation quality and using a visually appealing and well-organized template. Um, the first document that I created um, for our customer personas held five boxes. Who I am, how I interact, how I engage, what I need, and why I matter. So you can find templates galore well, with a search on the web or partner with your creative team to create a, a unique PowerPoint template. Um, for customer personas, it's always been my preference to not add a picture. Um, I believe that customer personas are representative of hundreds or thousands or even millions of persons um, and you care about what's on the inside and how they interact with your solution limiting your persona to a single face or gender may create unintentional bias um, so here's an example of a really basic template that addresses those key components you need to know about each of your customer personas so in summary start with identifying your customer personas next uh, research your personas using interviews then analyze your findings to start building out your personas and um, then turn your work into a tool that can be used by you, your team, or even better, the customer facing teams at your organization. All right, so with your customer personas developed, the next step is to map them along the customer journey or life cycle. In order to begin mapping, you need to know what's happening in each stage or phase. Then the real value of the customer persona work takes focus because your research and your deep knowledge of the customer personas will make you an expert for knowing where each of your personas is involved and more importantly, how they're involved. So it takes an understanding of knowing what's happening to each persona across the life cycle to create compelling persona-based messaging and engagement programs. Also, I highly recommend going through the journey mapping exercise one persona at a time. So for example, uh, the chart before you is one that I put together years ago for that administrator persona. <clears throat> And everything I know about how the administrator persona is involved and what's happening for that persona is through research and interviews. It's after the clear understanding of what's happening and what needs to be communicated to that persona during that life cycle stage that you can begin to determine and strategize how to best engage, how to best engage them. So for me, that's the fun part. So let's take this a step further. During the onboarding stage, one of your touch points is a welcome message to your new customers uh, to express excitement and enthusiasm with optimism for a successful partnership. With your, with your customer persona work mapped to the customer life cycle, you know that both a decision maker and administrator can play a role during onboarding. Yet how you engage and what you communicate to those personas is likely to differ significantly. The welcome message to the decision maker may want to emphasize the trust that was built during the buying and consideration stage. And you may know that your decision maker is very likely to be at an executive level and not directly involved in the implementation of the product or solution. In that case, a personal letter from the VP of sales or general manager is an appropriate tactic. Whereas your administrator persona is going to play a critical role during implementation and throughout onboarding. So it's time to set expectations with an overview of the project timeline, um, project resources um, to get the project team ready, or present a checklist of things to do in advance to get that first project kickoff meeting ready. So embedding customer personas into your customer life cycle is how you go from good to great. It's one thing to understand the touch points that are important and imperative throughout the journey. 
yet understanding the value and importance of knowing which customer personas fit into the various stages along the life cycle and what you need to communicate to them. And the optimal way to deliver that message is how you become great. So taking it to that level of detail ensures that you are sending the right message to the right person at the right time and in the right way. And from here, you can focus on how to engage your personas. So the more you know about your personas and what makes them tick or be responsive, the more capable you become of delivering a great experience. You'll be able to elevate the moments that matter and the milestones that mean something to them. So knowing what matters to your personas and how they prefer to be engaged is critical as it helps determine the elements and tactics for your customer programs, as well as where to allocate budget and resources. The how can be a fun process too, where any idea is discussed and new ideas are explored and discussions of new ways to present information are brainstormed. Additionally, it's not just about your product or service. When you prioritize personas as part of your customer marketing engagement planning and strategy, you become better positioned to recognize, acknowledge, and celebrate significant yet sometimes elusive key moments that delight your customers. Whether it's an obscure holiday that only that persona might know about, or an event that's specific to that persona, or just knowing that being thanked and appreciated during a really busy time of year or a certain time of year is how you make a difference and become memorable. So making um, make persona marketing a priority by putting it as the first step when you begin your planning processes. Identify the intended persona before you plan, strategize, or design a program campaign or event. Add persona as a field to your marketing briefs or your content briefs. Um, design content and craft communications with a specific persona in mind. Partner with other customer facing teams to develop a communication strategy that is centered on the persona. Even better, work with your operations team to embed personas as a field in your customer database. This makes creating segmented lists um, infinitely easier when you want to um, send a communication directly to that persona. All right, so now all of your hard work shouldn't be left to sit in the shelf and get dusty. You're going to want to keep your personas current with continuous research and interviews. And you can do this by creating a goal to conduct a certain number of interviews, um, possibly even making it a quarterly goal. Um, then you're going to want to validate um, your hypotheses to ensure you're hitting the mark with each persona. You know, for example, does one form of communication perform better than another? Do you receive higher response rates during a certain time of year, uh, day, or you know, a week? Um, be sure to update your research and documentation routinely so that your personas stay relevant and current. All right, everyone, thank you very much for joining me today and good luck on your persona journey. Um, and thanks for attending the session. All right, bye.
Hi, everybody. My name is Gal. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Cravocate. So excited to have you here on the Customer Marketing Summit this year. It's great. So many people are meeting together, sharing best practices, knowledge, and networking. I recommend that you find at least one thing that you can implement even in Q4 this year in your company, which would be great. Um, I also invite you to join our Customer Marketing Slack group together with HubSpot. Just reach out to us and we'll add you in. And to come to my session later today is going to talk about seven things I've learned from some of the greatest customer marketers out there. Enjoy. These days, authentic customer reviews, referrals, and references are what buyers trust and value most when making purchasing decisions. That's where Influitive comes in. We're the advocacy, community, and engagement platform of choice for the world's most customer-obsessed brands, including Adobe, Cisco, IBM, and Mountain Dew. Our advanced targeting, personalization, gamification, and rewards drive extreme engagement and customer growth at scale. Let Influitive help you turn your customers into loyal advocates and grow your business. Hey everyone, I'm Brie Bunzel coming to you live from Sydney, Australia. Over the course of my career, I've had experience in PMM, brand marketing, field marketing, and now focused on all things customer marketing. I'm excited to share more about my new customer advisory board masterclass. I learned about the importance of customer centricity at a young age of seven when I didn't have the right audience, messaging, positioning, and pricing in mind for my neighborhood lemonade stand. My market researcher father was not impressed with the poorly located stand, undervalued 10 cents cup of lemonade, and it was there that I began my 101 lesson on understanding customers. Since then, I've had the chance to work for a lot of incredible customer-centric companies, learning the frameworks and the value of customer visits, experiences and events that fuel feedback loops and drive the overall company strategy. My team and I at Dropbox built the first customer advisory board program globally, and I've created a blueprint for running a successful cab, all taught in this new cab masterclass. Cabs are an essential part and component of shaping your strategic framework for not only your product, but also your overall company strategy. This course will also help you understand the strategic benefits of a cab, help you get business buy-in from stakeholders, and provide the right templates and guidelines to build a better customer advisory board experience for your customers. You'll have a chance to learn best practices to drive engagement among your members, both virtual as well as in person, and you'll learn how to best incorporate those customer insights into your company feedback loops. You'll hear from cab experts at Asana, Adobe, Zendesk, LinkedIn, and the Product Marketing Alliance. It'll be filled with three hours of content, 13 chapters, three exclusive templates, and an official brand make a new certification to seal the deal. I hope to see you there. Hello, wherever you're joining us from today, we want to say a huge welcome to our global community. We hope that you're enjoying the Customer Marketing Summit. I also want to send out an extra special thank you to all our sponsors, partners, and participants who together have made this event possible. We are also delighted to welcome Crowdvocate as our headline sponsor today. Their sessions are bursting with insights to help you level up. But remember, the learning doesn't stop here. If you haven't already, you can upgrade your pass to include access to all today's sessions on demand with our Access All Areas Pass. Or you can become a PMA Pro member and benefit from unlimited access to exclusive templates, frameworks, and our entire library of videos and slide decks from our events. And remember, have your questions at the ready. Simply post your question in the comments section and get awesome advice from an expert in the field. 
What's not to love about that? So now, on to the next talk. Hello, and welcome to the three building blocks every advocacy program needs. My name is Erica Anderson, and I'm a senior director at Influitive. In this session, we'll be looking at how to build customer and advocacy programs that achieve the coveted win-win, where you're furthering your business goals and creating value for your customers. You'll leave this session understanding the key pillars of a successful customer advocacy program and with practical advice for kickstarting your program, even if you don't have budget for technology. Before we dive in, let's start with introductions. So take a minute to answer these questions in, this, in the chat, and I'll just give you a quick snapshot of my background. I actually started my career in reference management. I loved working with customers and stakeholders from across the business, but felt like it was pretty reactionary and that we only really talked to customers when we needed something from them. So I was really excited to move into a more proactive role where I was focused on um, starting and growing our online community. From there, we expanded with event programs like regional user groups, customer conference and customer advisory boards, and with educational programs like webinars, workshops, and Ask the Experts. Throughout running and setting up these different programs, I noticed that many of the same customers would pop up in these different programs and have so much energy and interest and passion for our brand. This led to starting a new advocacy program for the Oracle team that I was working on. And this is where I ran into Influitive. I like the Influitive product and team and vision so much that in January of 2021, I joined the Influitive team where I now serve on their practice team. So you could argue I am an example of the highest form of advocacy. I'm not going to go super in depth with why there is such a growth in advocacy and why I think your organization should be considering it today, but I wanted to touch on just a few main drivers for why I think advocacy is on the rise and why you're likely seeing more community, customer marketing, and advocacy roles in your LinkedIn feed. The first reason that you've probably heard is that buyers don't trust traditional marketing and sales. They're not even engaging sales until later in their sales cycle. As a result, companies are investing in advocacy programs to work with their customers to generate social proof that they can include in all of their marketing and sales efforts and help um, reach their target audience and establish trust through the voice of their peers. The second reason is that there's a huge increase in subscription-based businesses. With a subscription-based business, there is an urgency to have customers see value with their initial trial or purchase so that they will upgrade and buy more. Companies are heavily investing to improve their customer experience and investing in programs and processes to help customers be as successful with their investment as soon as possible and supporting them through expanding their usage. And as these Forrester stats testify to, advocacy, the art and science of listening, collaborating, and partnering with your customers to improve your business is good for the bottom line. All right, so in terms of setting up an advocacy program, there are three phase process that I want to take you through. A lot of companies come to us wanting all things advocacy, but we need to break it down and follow this process to get started. By following this process, you're gonna develop a clear proposal for why you need a program, what type of program you should invest in, and what type of investment is required. Keep in mind, you're planning a customer program, not a one-off campaign. Your efforts here are laying the tracks that will create a train of engagement and value for both your organization and customers for years to come. One final note is that throughout the slides, you'll see references to worksheets. Pull up your handout to see blanked, excuse me, blank and filled out versions of these worksheets for each step. We won't be going through these, process, these worksheets in detail because we want to save time for Q&A, but know these resources are available to you to reference throughout the webinar and afterwards to help you act on what we'll be talking about today. In phase one, it's all about definition. It's a very critical stage because you're looking to identify and prioritize what type of advocacy your organization needs and why. So like any initiative, you wanna start with the end in mind. Ask what your organization is trying to achieve this year, and then ask how your department is going to support that goal. 
The second aspect of setting goals is often overlooked because you need to understand the current state of what is being done today in relation to that goal. What problems are you facing? This is so important for two reasons. The first is that all design thinking starts with the problem. In order to design a customer program, you need a clear picture of what customer problem you're solving for. And the second reason is that it's very easy to set a pie in the sky goal that sounds like an industry leading approach or mirrors what your competitor is doing, but you need a clear starting place and a realistic plan that is anchored in your organization's current reality. It's very likely that you'll have several goals. That's okay, just make sure to prioritize them. If everything is a top priority, then nothing is, and it's very hard to put your resources and define a strategy that's going to help you be effective and uh, get the success that will help you get more resources to expand. So for the sake of example, let's say that your goal is about generating new revenue and you're in marketing. So you're likely thinking about growing the pipeline through targeted campaigns, and you're wondering how advocacy can help through maybe like referrals or references or reviews. That leads us to the second portion where we wanna think through our objectives. Objectives are the, typically the specific projects that you wanna to complete to support an overarching goal. In a customer program, you want to shift your objectives to be what you want your members to do in order to meet your goal. Then a core part of your program is focused on how to make those efforts easy and valuable to participate in, which we'll get to later. I've included some examples of possible member objectives tied to different business goals here. To continue with the goal of generating revenue, you might want members to submit reviews or take reference calls, submit testimonials, participate in success stories, submit referrals or share content on social or share a referral link on social. You can see there are lots of different ways that customers could help meet your goal. So even get more specific and prioritize them beyond the broad advocacy umbrella and really pick what are the specific behaviors you need members to do in order to meet your goal. From here, you wanna look at and find out who and what is available to help you with your goals. You do this by meeting with other departments to understand their goals, challenges, and KPIs and how they currently engage customers. You might have a crystal clear focus on your goals and feel ready to move on, but it's critical to take time to meet with other teams regardless of what department you're in. The first reason this is so important is that if there is alignment between goals, then having other teams aligned and supporting your program makes your job easier and your program's value proposition more compelling for your customers. The second reason is part of the secret sauce. Your customers interact with your brand as a whole, so you need to understand the context of your program through your customers' eyes. This will help you identify what the customers are and aren't getting from your organization and where your program could provide unique value to them. Throughout these conversations, you're also gonna find existing processes and programs that you can leverage. There's a great worksheet here to help you um, fill out and um, capture what your ecosystem is and how your program can be a part of it. So don't miss that. At this point, you'll have a sense of what type of advocacy program you need to start with. For example, you might be thinking you need a cab to gather feedback and inform company and product strategy, or potentially an executive sponsorship program to deepen relationships that support retention and expansion. It could be an advocacy program to generate a lot of different forms of social proof, or a beta program to systematically improve your products and get early advocates before rolling them out more broadly or a community to deflect your support costs and gather product enhancements. From there, you'll select KPIs based on your program's objectives and your company goals. To continue with our example of generating revenue, if you decide to prioritize reviews, you might measure the number of reviews gathered and then some other metric tied with how you're using reviews. It might be around customer choice awards or magic quadrant rankings leads from a campaign that's promoting the magic quadrant results, or maybe it's A-B testing on a campaign landing page to see how it performs when excerpts from reviews are included. Whatever your KPIs are, you want, KPIs are, you want to establish baselines so you can illustrate your program's impact and lay the foundation for growth, whether it's investing in more headcount or scaling with technology. 
Finally, make sure you have a system in place to measure your impact, even if it's just a spreadsheet. All right, moving on to phase two. Phase two is all about design, where we're going to be selecting our target market and planning our program's structure. Since you know your goals and what you need your members to do, you will want to intentional, intentionally select which customers you're targeting in your program. For some simple um, examples, if you're looking to have high level conversations about the direction of the market and where your solution fits in, you're probably gonna to wanna to talk with a higher level person like a VP or above. If you're looking for product feedback, you need people who are regularly using the product and likely even the person who's like the champion or the administrator for an organization or a power user. If you're looking for social proof, you wanna be focused on your happy, successful customers. If your goals are more around product adoption and retention, then you're likely looking at a program for all customers. I'd strongly recommend talking with some real life customers who fit your target market criteria in, under, in order to understand more about their role, their goals, and their pain points. You can't design a program for someone if you don't know what is meaningful to them. As much as possible, start with a narrow target so you can really tailor your program to resonate with a segment of your customer base and not try to be all things to all people. If you look at our second worksheet in the handout, you'll see a persona placemat, example of an advocate persona, and an interview guide to help you through the process of talk, developing a persona. From here, we wanna look at what needs to be in place in order for customers to participate in the desired behaviors or the member objectives that we discussed earlier. For each of your specific member objectives, map out their processes, including things like where the process starts, who does what throughout the process. And you may wanna note any additional criteria for a specific opportunity. For example, any customer can participate in your online community, but you have limited resources for case studies. So you're really trying to prioritize your case studies around target industries, for example. If you look at the third worksheet, you'll see a framework to help you do this with some examples. Now that you've outlined this, uh, excuse me, now that you've outlined how they're going to do it for you, that lets you identify opportunities to develop resources to, or um, define handoffs to help reduce the friction. So this ties back to making it easy to do the behaviors you want them to do. The second piece of this is thinking about how can we make it valuable for members to participate in these behaviors? Like what's in it for your target mark? target members or that persona that we discussed earlier to participate in these behaviors? And how is it going to help like reduce their pain and increase their gain? So really understanding what's meaningful to them is gonna help you here. So to do this, take each of your desired behaviors or your member objectives and just make a couple notes about what's the value for customers to participate. This is a good exercise that forces you to articulate the intrinsic value of the activities you're asking members to do it also helps you check how compelling your program is. What are you asking from and giving to members? What is your program offering that they can't get anywhere else? It's very likely that you'll need to invest in programming that's gonna create value for them. Often this comes in the form of helping them grow and meet their goals. And by doing this, you'll be building relationships with your organization. So a few examples of this is if you're looking to set up a cab and you know that like the networking and the problem solving is really important to them, it's likely that you'd wanna dedicate a portion of your cab agenda to customer roundtables or securing a customer showcase presentation. For an advocacy program, if you're pushing for like a lot of reviews, um, that might get kind of repetitive over time. And so you might want to look at offering something like a thank you or rewards or points for their effort to support you so that they can put their points towards something like a brandage flag or a conference pass or free training or gift cards. If you're setting up regular events like new product overviews or best practices, um, ask me anything or expert interviews, you're gonna make your community a much more compelling place to go to than if it's just forum boards where they can ask questions because you're providing a lot more material for them to learn from and spark conversations from. So in short, we want to have your goal and understand how, what you're asking members to do in order to support you. And then there's two sides to that. How do we make it easy for them to do those behaviors? And that's mapping out your process of what's in place to support those behaviors. And then this second piece is how do we make it 
valuable for them to do the behaviors. Some behaviors are gonna have a lot of intrinsic value, right? If you ask a question on your community and you get a quick response, then um, you know that's helpful because you got a good answer, but how are you gonna make it valuable for the person who's answering your question, answering questions on your community to get value? So there's some where you wanna be thinking about who's your target market? Who are you trying to go and get more um, activity from? All right, so by engaging this process, you will have the makings of your program's value proposition, which is core to your internal and external program communications. It includes who your, excuse me, why your program exists and who your program is for, what members do and what value they get, and then how to get started. I've included several examples here you can reference in the slides for you to see different ways that this has come to life. All right, phase three. In phase three, we have now defined and designed your program and you're ready to move into the final step of outlining what is going to be required to support the program. Every program requires a combination of people, process and technology coming together to achieve the goal. As we look at each of these, remember that your organization already has some of what you need. Look at what is existing that you can leverage, what you can build onto and what is missing and needs to be developed. So from a, from a uh, people standpoint, it's very common to start with one Uber customer role. Uh, this is typically someone who's manager or hire who starts the program. This person needs to be very strategic with strong communication and relationship building skills, creative and organized. It's really core that they're thinking bigger than just the initial program. They need to develop a plan and a roadmap or vision and then execute on it and prove the success so they can get more resources and start building out a bigger vision with more specialized roles. From a process and technology standpoint, we've listed processes that are common to advocacy programs. Of course, the specifics will vary depending on what type of program you're starting, but you can easily identify what is needed between the work that you did earlier and this list. We've also included some common technology requirements to support those processes. If you don't have a budget, you could start a program with in-house tools that you already have, improve your success and grow from there. However, many organization requirements do mature as they get weary of living in spreadsheets and emails, and they're struggling to leverage existing data or share the data they're gathering back with the organization. They feel like they're overusing advocates or they're not systematically giving back or that their program is going well, but they really need to do more to scale and automate it um, beyond what their in-house tools can support. And so they look to invest in uh, advocacy and community platform like Influitive that can help really build out their program and take it to the next level. All right, so by engaging with this process, you can plan the different types of customer programs that your organization might need. You might have one platform powering your customer programs, but you shouldn't have just one Uber customer program. You should have a holistic approach to your customer programs and develop different programs addressing distinct customer segments and their unique needs. If you look at worksheet five, you'll see ex examples of different customer programs with the goals, behaviors, process, and value filled out to help you see how this co could come to life for your organization. All right, so let's look at some real life examples to get a little bit more tangible on how these programs come to life for each customer segment. If we start with all customer programs at the bottom of our pyramid, you can see here that it, you could have like kind of a one-stop customer shop or a central area that includes things like forums for them to have ask product uh, questions and get answers and help from their peers and your support team. You could set up an area for customers to submit their product ideas and enhancement requests with voting and up updating the status when ideas are released. You can have an events calendar that um, highlights the different upcoming um, virtual and physical events that they could participate in and setting up groups, whether it's industry groups or special interest groups or regional groups. You can also offer onboarding programs or education, training or certification programs product announcements, or content that you would like them to read, like customer stories to help them understand core use cases and apply best practices. 
You'll oftentimes want to be highlighting industry news to them. You could have a job board within your customer base. You could have regular feedback opportunities about how they're using the product or their org details. Or you, can, you have other feedback opportunities like voice of the customer program or NPS. Now here's an easy example of how you can systematically start to tie your programs together and recruit advocates from your overall customer base and create a journey for them. With Influitive, you can start to target your members with different opportunities based on what you know about them. This could range from product usage, location, industry, or even something as simple as their NPS score. If they're a detractor, you might ask them for more feedback or notify their CSM. If they're a promoter, you could start sharing advocacy opportunities for them, which brings us to our next customer segment around advocates. This focuses on different opportunities and programs geared towards advocates. So oftentimes reviews and references are great initial asks of advocates to help them get warmed up. Success stories in a case study or a video or an event session are also great ways to capture an advocate story. But there's so much more that your customers can do from you, ranging from testimonials to sprinkle in your website and email campaigns. There's beta or UX testing. They could be sharing content on, on social or posting to social or submitting referrals for you. But it doesn't stop there. You can be tapping them for user-generated content like use cases, templates, blog posts, or participating in like ROI studies, which are great for lead gen. You also can be doing um, different industry awards or annual awards, which are a great way to recognize top customers and learn more about new customer stories. You can be gathering first party data about your customers for deeper insights and to do more um, personalization and moments of delight with them. And you can also be doing things to where you offer like mentor or buddy programs and help your most successful customers take other customers along the same journey and benefit from their expertise. In the final stage of our um, pyramid here, we're focused on the elite customer programs. Elite customer programs are going to be reserved for your most strategic customers and most often by current or potential revenue or because they're using you know, priority products or in a target industry. There also could be programs that are elite because it's tied to a certain segment of the customer base, like your top advocates um, or, or like your most top strategic advocates or super users who are answering so many questions in, in your community and really active in the broader um, ecosystem for your product. In those scenarios, there's usually like a certain criteria that has to be met and a time frame, and they're, they have to requalify annually. But let's take a quick look at how some of the um, and Influitive can help power some of those types of customer programs. Since elite customer programs are reserved for your most strategic customers, they're exclusive with some kind of criteria to get in. So you could have exclusive channels to support your CABs, industry councils, or campaigns to support an executive event. Um, or as I mentioned, you might have a program that's geared towards like top advocates or um, super users where there's a certain criteria and the, the time frame that they would have access to that exclusive area. Within Influitive, you can leverage gamification mechanics with points, badges, levels, and leaderboards across all these different programs. And finally, you can reward your customers for their participation by letting them use their points to redeem rewards, whether it's company swag, free training, certification vouchers, charitable donations, free consulting sessions, golf with the CEO, and more. Your rewards portfolio can be part of creating a unique and differentiated brand experience for your customers. And with that, we will move to Q&A. Thanks so much for your time today.
Hi, everybody. My name is Gal. I'm CEO and co-founder at Cravocay. So excited to have you here on the Customer Marketing Summit this year. It's great. So many people are meeting together, sharing best practices, knowledge, and networking. I recommend that you find at least one thing that you can implement even in Q4 this year in your company, which would be great. Um, I also invite you to join our Customer Marketing Slack group together with HubSpot. Just reach out to us and we'll add you in. And to come to my session later today, we're going to talk about seven things I've learned from some of the greatest customer marketers out there. Enjoy. These days, authentic customer reviews, referrals, and references are what buyers trust and value most when making purchasing decisions. That's where Influitive comes in. We're the advocacy, community, and engagement platform of choice for the world's most customer-obsessed brands, including Adobe, Cisco, IBM, and Mountain Dew. Our advanced targeting, personalization, gamification, and rewards drive extreme engagement and customer growth at scale. Let Influitive help you turn your customers into loyal advocates and grow your business. Whether you're joining a Product Marketing Alliance event for the first time, or if you're a seasoned regular, welcome to the second edition of the Customer Marketing Summit. Before we dive into the day's content, we just want to say a huge thank you to our sponsors, partners, speakers, and you, our lovely audience. From wherever you're watching in the world, we're sure you'll enjoy the sessions from our incredible lineup. With expert presentations, specialist talks, and deep dive panel sessions on the agenda, you are in for a real treat today. To get the most out of these sessions, please ensure you are sharing your feedback and asking all your questions in the comments section, and our speakers will be answering them throughout the day. After the event, a great place to continue the conversation is in the customer marketing channel in the PMA Slack community. If you aren't already a member, hop on over and come and join the discussion. And if that's still not enough, then why not become a PMA Pro member and benefit from unlimited access to exclusive templates, frameworks, and our entire library of videos and slide decks from all our events. So with all that to come, let's dive right into the next session. Hi everyone, and welcome to our session today on building an always on advocacy engine. Today, we'll start off with some introductions and a background on our approach to customer marketing at Looker. And then we'll deep dive into customer advocacy and the engine that we've built. Uh, finally, since we are data lovers here at Looker, we'll wrap up with a look at how we measure success and show the ROI of all of the work that we've been doing. I'm Mayor Newton, Senior Manager of Customer Marketing at Looker, which is part of Google Cloud. And I've been with Looker for over five years, and I primarily focus on customer engagement campaigns and programs. With me today is my amazing colleague, Matt Aru. Matt, I'll pass it over to you for an intro. Thanks, Mayor. Hi, everyone. My name is Matthew Aru, and I've been with Looker for about two years now, and I run the Customer Advocacy Program. My goal is really to identify, recruit, and engage with our top advocates to support marketing, sales, and events. I'm really excited to speak with you today. Thanks, Matt. So let's jump right in. I'll start with a quick overview of how we approach customer marketing at Looker. So this is what we call our customer marketing bow tie. <laughs> uh, we have a traditional demand gen funnel that focuses on really driving awareness, educating prospects, and accelerating deals in order to acquire new customers. Uh, once an account becomes a customer, that's where our team takes over. And we handle things like scaled outreach in order to engage those new customers, 
And then through that engagement, we strive to help those customers be successful so that they adopt, grow their usage, add new products and new use cases, and really grow how much they're using our product. And then finally, of course, those happy customers work with us to develop content and become advocates so that we can then pipe all of that content back into our demand engine. So this is sort of a, a view of how we think about the content um, because really customers are the center of it all. They're the center of all of the content and campaigns that we're running their pain points, their successes, that really drives our strategy and our messaging. So our advocacy engine is not just fueling our marketing pipeline overall, it's really forming the foundation for everything that we do. So in order to build up those advocates that are so important to us and that fuel all of our marketing efforts, we first need to have happy customers. So I'll dive a little bit deeper into the customer marketing components of our marketing engine and how we utilize those scaled touch points with customers to really foster customer success. So in our customer marketing team, we really focus on engagement, growth, and then of course, advocacy. And so I'll start by going through how we think about each of these from a customer perspective by putting ourselves in the customer's shoes. So as a customer using a product like Looker, um, should you go back one slide, please? No problem. So yes, this is the customer view. So as a customer using a product like Looker, uh, one of my primary goals is really to learn about the product capabilities so that I can understand how the product can help me. This is especially true for new customers coming on, um, but as well as for customers that have been around for a while, because we do have frequent software releases and new things coming out that we need to educate them on. Um, think about the last time you started using a new product. I very recently started using Pendo for the first time, which is a tool that Looker uses for in-application announcements. And the first thing that I wanted to do when I got in there was to learn how to set up a guide and set up an announcement. If I were to start receiving sales messages from Pendo right away, I'd be a little turned off. Um, so we try to keep that in mind, where our customers are and what they're looking for uh, at a, any given point in their journey. Once we do have a customer engaged and we know that they're starting to see the value of the product, that's when they might become interested in finding new ways to use the product. That's how I would feel at least. So for Looker, what this means is, you know, maybe rolling out to new departments, uh, incorporating new data sets to solve for new use cases or possibly embedding analytics. Um, so we aim to really hold off on these messages until the customer has indicated in some way that they're ready to learn more about those types of opportunities. And then finally, as a hopefully happy, successful uh, and growing customer, um, I might be willing to talk about my experiences and share success stories. So this is really where we try to get our customers to. And getting them to that stage is, is really the holy grail because this is what creates the validation for all of the marketing claims that we make. Um, and so let's now dive into a little more about what, what we do as a marketing team in order to help nurture customers along with this journey in mind. So engagement, this is really the first step. In general, we try to use our knowledge of our customers to get the right message to the right person at the right time. Sounds a lot easier than it is. Uh, we have a lot of different types of users who are interact with Looker and with data, all in different ways. So to engage users across our customer base, we focus on targeted emails and web events, which includes things like tailored onboarding for different types of users, from people who just look at dashboards to people who are administering the entire platform. Uh, we look at things like nurture programs to showcase high value features of the platform, like out of the box integrations with other tools. Uh, we host webinars that highlight new product features that have been released and how they work. Um, and of course, we have digital events that really focus on key segments of our customer base, like a particular industry, uh, so that we can showcase how other customers are using Looker and getting value. Uh, 
And really a core component of events like these, uh, email nurtures, all of the content that comes out through customer engagement are the customer stories and case studies that we have through advocacy. So really it all comes back to advocacy. The next stage in our customer funnel is growth. So as customers really engage with our emails and attend our events, we look for signals that they may be interested in doing more. For example, if a customer using Looker for internal business intelligence downloads content about data monetization, then that signals to us that they might be interested in expanding from internal analytics to an embedded use case. Um, so to really nurture customers through this part of the journey, we lean on things like product demos that highlight the benefits of additional product offers or intimate roundtables that again, lean on our customer base who are already successful with some of these new use cases to connect with customers thinking about taking that next step so that they can learn from each other. And for larger customers, we even host events called data days that bring together people from different departments or subsidiaries within the same organization so that they can learn from each other in a more private, intimate, internal setting. And then finally, the third stage in our, in our funnel is advocacy, um, because all of these activities that we're doing really helps us build up a database of happy, healthy customer advocates. And advocates are what enable us to continue to engage and grow our customer base by sharing their stories through blogs, through case studies, through their knowledge at events and roundtables. So we really do make customers the focal point of our messaging and the work that Matt has been doing to build our customer advocacy program is really what's enabling us to do this at scale. So with that, I will pass it over to the amazing Matt Arut himself to talk about our customer advocacy program. Thanks, Mayor. It's great to see the customers all the way through the, the funnel there. I'd like to talk a little about advocacy. It's the tent pole of our program, as we call it. At Looker, we have a couple different ways of thinking about advocacy, but I like to break it down as most great presentations have as a pyramid. Um, we have three types of advocacy activities, high touch activities, medium touch activities, and low touch activities. High touch activities are ones that are gonna take the most amount of time. They're the ones that you really wanna make really white glove treatment for the customer. And examples of those are brand campaigns, keynote speakers, and press and analyst opportunities. For medium touch advocacy activities, we have things like reference calls, case studies, blogs, and event speakers for breakout sessions and things like that. These are events and touches that are going to still need you to react and work, work with the customer, but they're not as white glove as some of the high touch activities that you're building at the top. And then we've got low touch activities. These are things that are absolutely vital to the business, but they really don't take much interaction. You can do them what we kind of joke about is at scale. We have online reviews, analyst reports, and community activity and engagement. So those are the types of activities that we do for advocacy here at Looker. And I want to have you all learn a little bit about some, what are some tips and tricks and strategies that we put into place to make sure that we are able to support all of that. I don't know about you, but in my experience being a customer advocacy manager, there's never enough of me. I wish I could have five people on a team, but usually there's one or two people that run the customer advocacy program. So we really want to make sure that you're able to prioritize and work, you know, to the top of a level of your ability there, but also have as much output as possible and focus on the right things. So in my years of experience, I put together a couple of tips and strategies that we use here at Looker that I hope you can walk away with. The first tip is automate advocacy. Everything that you can do to automate things, go ahead and start doing that. That's going to give you the ability to start doing some of the high touch activities that you really need to be focusing on that take more of your time and personal approach. So I always do is I start with the MPS results. Most companies all do an MPS, but the question is, what are you doing with those promoters? So for me, what we have set up is if someone's a promoter, we automatically put them on an email drip campaign for online reviews with G2, Gartner Peer Insights, um, you know, Captera, all these online review sites give the opportunity for you to then automate an email to send out to your customers if they give you a high MPS result. The, the question is, will they recommend you? Well, let's see if they will recommend you. You can do that through you know, Marketo or any of your email platforms. Um, the other thing that we do is we automate advocacy for community engagement. 
if someone is willing to give us a high MPS score, we also want to encourage them to drive them into the community so that they can engage and be part of our community and contribute back to some of the discussions, which really help us out by answering some questions that other customers might have and really building like a really great community of customers. Another way we automate advocacy is we'd use tech validate for lightweight customer content. So instead of reaching out to every single customer for a case study, we can do email blasts that send out to specific customers based on MPS and engagement. And then we like ask them to complete the tech validate survey, which then creates a lightweight case study. These are some simple things that you can do really quick that are going to make a difference and give you more time to focus on the rest of these strategies. I highly encourage you jumping in and trying to automate as much as you can. Platforms such as Influitive and things like that are also great for you to leverage. Sometimes those take some time to maintain, but the value is there too. The second strategy I would suggest is aligning on goals. So, you know, what is a measurable program goal? You know, we always talk about what are the goals of the program and things like that. Every program is going to be a little bit different. And as long as you set up what your main goal is, focus on that and then build cascading goals for each of the departments. You know, before you do anything, you're going to have that conversation of executive buy-in and leadership commitment to advocacy. I'm assuming you're all working on that already, but when the rubber hits the road is measurable goals and aligning with the other teams. For example, the customer success team at Looker and I connected and we built some mutual goals for their team. One of my goals was to drive online reviews, tech validate, things of that nature, things that they could reach out to their customers and ask them to complete. That wouldn't mean any handholding on my part, but something that our, our customer success team could take the lead on. And so what I did is I built advocacy in a box templates, emails that they could send to the customer, you know, really simple copy and paste that they can take advantage of. But I also aligned with the leadership of customer success and they are held accountable for specific advocacy goals and activities. So each quarter, they're responsible for a certain amount of advocacy activities. And it's really great because we all align on how important they are. And I then can then pass that responsibility onto the team and know that it's going to get done. And, you know, that's just one example. You can work with your sales team. You can work with professional services. We have really lucky at Looker. We have the Department of Customer Love, and that's our support team. And it's really great to work with them also to identify product advocates and those that want to give feedback on new features and things like that. Um, so just again, aligning on your goals, but building cascading goals down to other teams is really an easy way for you to, again, shift some of the responsibility and advocacy activities to other teams so that they can be held accountable, but also it's exciting for them because they can hit their goals. And at the end of the day, it's all moving your advocacy program in the right direction. So those are two really easy strategies that you can put together to start building more time for yourself to do the third part, which is household names. At the end of the day, for me and Looker specifically, you know, we really want to focus on getting advocacy from some of the largest household names in the world. I always want these, these customers take more time and commitment because you have to put on the white glove treatment for them. And if you're busy doing online reviews, getting customers for analyst reports, you know, doing all these activities, you're not spending the time on the household names. So if you do the first two, you're gonna have more time for the household names. So tips that I think with that are understanding what brand campaigns you have going on this year. Understand very clearly from your marketing team, what are your needs for the year? If you can align with them, you can start strategizing on which customers you should be spending your time with. Don't shoot for all the great customers. Sometimes you have a ton of great customers and you can go reach out to a lot of them, but you're spreading yourself thin. In my experience, pick about 10 accounts, align with CS, sales, marketing, that these are the 10 accounts that you really want to focus advocacy on, and then do some really great things for them, such as building out a year-long co-marketing plan and presenting it to the team. Being able to present to that customer and say, this is how we want to co-market with you for the year, it gives you a guiding roadmap for the year of what to expect. It sets expectations at the beginning of what they're signing up for. And it also sets up the cadences that you really need to start reaching out to them on a monthly or quarterly basis and letting them know, hey, we've done the press release with you. Next step is we'd love to do a case study. After that, we'd like to take you through, you know, a speaking at event. Really think of co-marketing as a journey that you're going on with the customer and setting that expectation up at the beginning. And don't try to do that for all of your accounts. Pick 10 and just rock those 10 out. Um, the other thing that I would do is, in my experience, get in front of their PR and comms team as soon and early as possible. 
Many times you're going to have amazing, great uh, advocates that are willing to do a lot of things. But at these larger brand household name companies, you really need to focus on getting with their PR and comms team so that they do everything correctly. Become best friends with the PR and comms team. Set up monthly meetings with them. You're going to have your customer success team, your sales team are all going to be reaching out to these customers and making sure you're working with them. But if you align with the PR and comms team, when those activities and opportunities come up, the, the paperwork and the, the release forms and all those things just make it really quick and you're already set ahead of the, the whole process. So my suggestion is definitely get aligned with the PR teams of those accounts as early as possible and you know become best friends with them. Now, the fourth strategy is really one that we should all be doing, reporting and over communicating. Um, usually there's one or two people running an advocacy program. So your time is really valuable, but this is so important. You have to drive visibility to your program for you to one, ask for more resources in the next year, two, to keep top of mind that the program is going on. And you know, CS and sales, everybody is busy and you wanna make sure that this is always top of mind and bringing it up there. So what I do personally here at Looker is I do weekly update emails to the customer success team, letting them know what opportunities are coming up, what happened this week, and you know, hey, just a reminder, if you have great customers, here's the process to bring them to my attention. The second one is I would do event specific emails. So let's say you have a user conference coming up or you have a you know a prospect conference coming up and you're responsible for collecting and build or building out these customer speakers do daily updates. Everybody needs to see the status of your selection of the customers and how things are moving so that you can keep top of mind. And it also is a great way for you to bring visibility to your, your, your program. But more importantly, every day you get to see incremental improvements. So let's say for your user conference, you have 10 customers that you have to select. And the first week you get one, second week you get two. After these, you know, you send it to the head of sales, head of CS, the leadership team that you think is right, and keeping them in the loop of what's going on is gonna give you more visibility for your program, but also a reminder to those teams, oh, hey, just when they're in their, their weekly meetings, they're gonna cascade that message down to their team. It's really important. And then the last suggestion is just one that I personally love. Make sure you thank those that have helped you. When a customer success manager or sales rep or professional services brings a customer to your attention or they help do an introduction to a customer, do whatever you can to send thank you to them, but also CC their manager on it. You know, they're going above and beyond. Advocacy is a company-wide objective and something we all need to do. And so when they do something for you, make sure you thank them. And that's going to make that person want to do more advocacy with you again in the future. You know, they're also building their career. When they do their, their annual reviews, they want to copy and paste an email that said, oh, so-and-so really brought up the best customer to my attention and they're now a keynote speaker at our conference. Take the time and thank the people that have helped you along the way, and it'll do you a lot of good. So those are the four big strategies for Looker's advocacy engine. And I also want to just show you really quick, um, we actually use Looker at Looker to manage our program. So I have a uh, process set up and using a dashboard within Looker, it's our BI intelligence platform, so that at any time, anybody can jump right in and see the status of my program. This is an example of my dashboard that tells the total number of advocates, number of unique accounts, you know, who actually referred them, what's my growth over time, and then I break it down by segments, by product type. Really simple with anybody or executive, anyone at all wants to see what's going on with your program, I can then send them a link to this dashboard and they can easily see what's going on. If you don't have Looker, you can use different other platforms too, but I would definitely suggest, you know, Looker is a great way to learn a little bit and showcase the, the work that you're doing. And Mayor, I'd love for pass on to you and talk about you know, how we measure success here at Looker. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Matt. Um, so Matt's touched on a lot of great tips for advocacy. I talked a bit about how our broader marketing funnel works, but how do we actually measure the success of what we do? It's, it's always tricky, especially on the customer side, because there are so many touch points happening with each of those customers and users that we connect with. So I'll walk through a few metrics that we use to measure the success of our own programs and, and give you some ideas of how we think about it. So I'll start with some really high level metrics that are important to us. And the first is user adoption. 
it's really a primary way that we try to uh, move the needle and make our customers successful. And we do a lot of work here through onboarding initiatives. So uh, we've built four different onboarding email nurture streams, and those really target and capture every new account and persona at the right point in their life cycle based on the product that they purchase and the way in which they interact with Looker. So once we launched these, uh, these new four programs, um, we actually compared the new cohort of customers going through the new streams with a previous cohort who didn't go through these new streams. So what we found is that when we looked at this scaled onboarding program, customers who went through the five month scaled program saw a 150% higher user adoption rate, and that's monthly active users over total purchase licenses um, in month five, so at the end of that program, compared with those who did not go through. So that was one way that we were able to implement something to try to move the needle on user adoption and then actually measure the success of that program. The second thing that, of course, we want to be doing as a team is really moving the needle for upsell pipeline. Um, so our team actually built our upsell engine from scratch. And thanks to a combination of cross-sell campaigns, educational email nurtures that I've talked about, uh, different webinars and events that, of course, feature our amazing customer advocates, we were able to produce an outstanding group of upsell opportunities for our sales team. Um, so we saw year over year, and this was 2019 to 2020, since we're still in 2021, uh, we saw a 340% year over year increase in marketing sourced pipeline. So the pipeline that we were actually able to source as a marketing team in upsell opportunities for sales. And then we also saw a 440% increase year over year in marketing influenced pipeline. So this isn't necessarily the opportunities that we are sourcing for the sales team, but ones that we're helping to nurture along once they become opportunities. Finally, on the advocacy front, in addition to, of course, supporting all of the campaigns and programs and content that help drive those other metrics with our onboarding programs and our upsell campaigns, um, Matt was able to bring in over 700 new customer reviews. And this really helped Looker become a leader on the key industry reports that we focus on, like Bark, G2, Gartner Peer Insights. And those are so important for our business and our sales team. So I actually want to kind of double click into that metric specifically, um, because one of the most important things about this is that Matt was able to automate the reviews campaign so that not only brought in results, but it required no time from him after it was set up. So he was freed up to focus on the household names and the brand campaigns and the other things that he mentioned earlier that really take up a much more significant portion of his time. So here's a program that's super important for our business and something that through scaled touch points and some upfront effort, Matt was able to create something that would self-sustain so that he can focus on those things that really do require that more personalized touch. So what this funnel is showing is that we were able to, through a set of two emails, and this was in Q1 of 2021, uh, we were able to reach over 400 customers. Um, and of those customers, a little over half actually opened the emails, which is great. And just under 20% did end up leaving us reviews, which is really helpful. It shows us, number one, that we have successfully engaged our customers to the point where they want to leave us reviews. Um, and number two, it gave us over 700 reviews, which is what propelled us, as I mentioned, into the leader category on those three major reports that really are vital assets for our sales teams and our business as a whole. And with that, we'll wrap up. Uh, I hope this gave you some tips for how you can build an advocacy program if you haven't yet, um, or if you do have an advocacy program, how you can scale that program, even if, like us, you may just have a team of one. Thank you, and have a great day. Bye, everyone.
Hi, everybody. My name is Gal. I'm CEO and co-founder at Cravocate. So excited to have you here on the Customer Marketing Summit this year. It's great. So many people are meeting together, sharing best practices, knowledge, and networking. I recommend that you find at least one thing that you can implement even in Q4 this year in your company, which would be great. Um, I also invite you to join our Customer Marketing Slack group together with HubSpot. Just reach out to us and we'll add you in. And to come to my session later today is going to talk about seven things I've learned from some of the greatest customer marketers out there. Enjoy. Welcome back to the Customer Marketing Summit. We have another fantastic live session for you now. I am joined by the wonderful Neil McLean, who's co-founder at Novatic, uh, for his session. And yeah, just before we let Neil take it away, just want to remind everybody that we are going to be running a brief live Q&A after the session. So any questions, opinions, points you want clarified, pop them in the chat and I'll catch up with Neil in 20 minutes or so. So welcome, Neil. Over to you. Thank you so much. Excited to, to be here today and to share more about what we found. Um, so for context, I'm Neil McLean, one of the co-founders here at Novatic. And at Novatic, we help sales and marketing teams create interactive product demos without engineering. So one of the common use cases that we see is creating interactive product tours. So we'll cover that in a bit, but the conversation that we're focusing on today is looking at how do early customers interact with your product? And the lens in which we viewed this is by studying around 5,600 B2B SaaS CTAs and looking at what is the way in which early customers are getting into the product, how are they experiencing it, and what does that motion look like? And we're going to contextualize this by looking at it a few things. So number one is, you know, what does that CTA look like and what are some trends that we've seen in our analysis of the industry broadly? We'll also look at a few different categories specifically. So we'll first examine the product trial, the sales-led demo, the tried and true one, and then also looking at this new emerging combination, which is the product tour. We'll then go into some, some Q&A after. But one of the ways in which we wanted to, to do this is by building the right prospect experience. Because one of the things that we have been realizing as we've been embarking on our journey at Novatic and broadly as we've talked to marketers in the space is that building the right end-to-end -end customer journey is extremely important. And as we know, it doesn't just start when they visit your website. They hear about you through G2, they talk to friends in Slack channels, maybe a friend talking about your software directly. But a lot of the buying process happens previous to them visiting the website. So when they're on the website, it's really important that you provide that max level experience considering the level of research that's been done before. So the way in which you can engage buyers is really critical, especially because that website is becoming the most important conversion mechanism you have in the entirety of the funnel. So today we'll look at how different teams across different verticals of software are engaging those prospective buyers and how they're accommodating different call to actions to reflect that and the language behind that is something that we'll explore today. And as we'll see here, there's a bunch of different ways that folks have accommodated that call to action. And we'll first start by looking at a tried and true go-to-market model, which is the trial. Many of you have seen the growth of, of the product by growth movement through the last few months, and it has taken the market by storm because it's super impactful in many ways. And what we did first is in our analysis of these 5,600 B2B SaaS ETAs, is we looked at what are some common keywords and themes 
and how often are those used? So a little bit of context into our methodology is we looked at and all of these sites looked at what does that call to action look like? And we grouped them according to different categories of software and how they relate to their peers. For the tree free trial specifically, what you're seeing here is a word cloud where the size of the text corresponds to the frequency in which they've been raised. So you'll see that free trial is by far and away the, the most common way to indicate the trial is available on the website. Start free trial and permutations that are also available. But one of the other interesting findings that we had is that actually it's really common for folks not only to, to offer that trial, but to have it be requested. So if you go to a website and click trial, oftentimes it may say free trial or start free trial, but you're actually chatting with someone on sales or customer success before getting into the product. There's oftentimes this push-pull between what vendors uh, really enjoy and what prospects really want. And this is oftentimes a viewed as a, a hybrid approach or happy medium of sorts, because prospects can get hands-on with the product, they can you know, experience it, loop in other members for the evaluation. But at the end of the day, the, the sales team or the customer success team can experience their use case, can do full discovery and get a better read on the opportunity. So that hybrid request trial model is something that we've seen a lot of companies adopt especially those in the BB SaaS space. So the next thing we wanted to look at is where do product trials succeed and where do they fall short? And what you notice on that category for the left is that there's certain areas of, of software where a trial really makes sense. And the common theme across those top left three bullets is that if you have a category of software that's known in the market, a trial is a really compelling offering. And the reason is, if for a project management tool, people already know what they're signing up for. There's a lot of clarity into the value proposition that project management tools have. So if you're at ClickUp or Monday.com, having people experience the product right away, it makes total sense. And adjacent to that is just the quick time to value. So if users can go into your product and see the value that you're offering in 15, 20 minutes, maybe even less, that's really compelling. So you can get people into the product right away. You can have usage, perhaps usage based pricing to either add that to value. And there's a lot of, of great leverage you can pull if the product can easily um, be experienced. And, and related to that is there's not much time holding, not much hand holding needed for that specific product. Now, there's areas where trials fail too. And this is related to a lot of the education that needs to be done, often through a sales led model. So if someone's experiencing a product right away and they don't really understand what the value proposition is, they don't really understand how this can be applied to their use case, that's oftentimes pretty challenging. And this often happens in niche markets that are oftentimes emerging. Another area where trials fails is top-down sales. So if you're selling to the CIO, the CRO, it's really hard to, to convince them to spend 14 days in, the, in your product. So getting a, a way for them to experience the product in a different way, that makes sense there. And lastly, if there's barriers to entry in, into your tool or service, it, a trial probably wouldn't make sense. So think about a supply chain management tool with integrations. If, you, if it takes a month to set up the product, it probably doesn't make sense to have users go through that pain just to see how it works. So there's different areas and considerations that we've seen from, from the market as far as where trials win and where they fall short. So the next question we had is not only, you know, where do they win, where do they fall short, but what duration and what sort of categories are offered for, for trials? And what you see here is a chart of the different categories of software where trials are prevalent. So you'll see specifically project management tools, e-commerce tools, email marketing tools are all areas where trials make a lot of sense. And the common theme among a bunch of these, while not you know, entirely true, is, is that a lot of these have quick time to value. So let's just pick email marketing, for example. If you are running an email marketing company, let's just say like a MailJet, you can have users sign up for your platform. They can import their list of contacts and send a personalized email in perhaps 20, 30 minutes. So it makes total sense. You want people to have that experience and try it out. The same goes for content management system like a box or Dropbox or you know, project management tools like a money.com, et cetera. These tools are, have a lot of similarities in the sense they have very low time to see that value. And for a lot of these products, it can often be a very frictionless product, frictionless process to see the value there. 
So the next question that we ask is, you know, in addition to what verticals of software tend to get trials, what duration of the time is typical for these trials? And we looked at you know, 14 days, 30 days, and seven days. And we found is by far 14 days was the most common. So you'll look at this graph down here and around 72% um, of the companies we looked at had 14 day trials on the website as it was advertised. Around 16% did 30 days and around 12% did seven days. And we talked to, to customers that had these different ranges of trials and we tried to figure out, you know, what is driving a seven day versus 14 day trial? Why did you make that decision? And one of the things that we learned is that a lot of companies start by offering a quick trial period, perhaps it's seven days. But what inevitably happens is that five business days to, to evaluate software, which in many cases, you know, larger ACVs, there's a lot of evaluation there, isn't necessarily the not, uh, not right enough time. So the other people have to be looped into the evaluation and it inevitably gets extended to a longer period of time. But a 14 day mix, just like the request trial model is a nice mix between what's vendor friendly and what's prospect friendly. So people can have 10 business days to experience the product. They can loop in other members to the evaluation, but it's not an over, overbearing amount of time for the sales teams. So that's what we found around time-based trials. What I next wanted to go through is the demo. So this is the tried and true model for a lot of sales. And this was the main way that people went through the sales motion um, for, for most products. So one of the things that we'll look at here is, let me just go back here, is, there we go, is the common language or terminology that's used for showcasing the demo. And as you'll see here, as indicated by the size of the text, request a demo is by far and away the most common way to indicate the, that's the next step in the sales funnel. Schedule a demo and get a demo or, or post seconds and thirds. But what we'll see here is something that we've experienced when doing our research is that oftentimes a demo doesn't actually correspond to that demo on the first call. And what we've seen is a lot of teams switch their demo based CTA, something that's actually reflective of the sales process. What often happens is people request a demo and they go into the first call expecting to see the product, see how it works. And what ends up happening is that they talk to you at a you know, 22 year old SGR that's just asking them questions and they're not seeing any value from that conversation. So while, while some companies have you know, adjusted their um, CTAs, that may make sense in your, in your circumstance to avoid challenging that prospect relationship. So we've seen companies switch from request to demo or schedule demo to talk to sales, get in touch, contact us, because if that's what's actually happening in the sales funnel, it's important to set that expectation up front to avoid frustrating the prospect experience. So we'll next do is look at where demos win and where demos fail in the broader spectrum. So where they win is if you have a sale or product that's built on direct relationships with longer deal cycles, it may make a lot of sense to do a demo. These are oftentimes enterprise level deals, higher ACVs, you know, in the hundreds of, of thousands. Uh, but you can also do this for, for smaller um, ACVs as well. It's not preclusive, of course. But where relationships matter and education matters is another really important element. So if your tool is in that niche or emerging industry where you need to describe and provide more context on the value that your product provides, it truly totally makes sense that a, a demo and that human connection be really important. And also tailoring would, would also be something that's helpful. So if you wanted to showcase a very comp, uh, a very configurable or give a product that you really want to understand at a deep level and show that to a, a prospective customer in a very desired state, having a demo allows you that ownership over the entire process, which makes total sense in this circumstance. But as we know from product like growth, when you have humans in the funnel, it also means that customer acquisition cost is high. And sales teams spend a lot of cycles on prospects who just want to see the product and how it works. So that just browsing crowd can take a lot of valuable time from your sales teams when a lot of folks just want to see how the product works. So that is a definite downside there. The other ones that we've seen is bottoms up selling becomes a really big challenge, especially when you have these startups that you're working with that don't necessarily have a high ACV or high willingness to pay. 
And the other area that we've seen is if you lack user engagement. So in the trial or product tour, people are actively experiencing the product. They're clicking around, they're seeing how it works in a way that's deeply tangible. If it's a demo, it's a sit back experience, you're seeing how things are going and you may have some degree of engagement, but it's far less stimulating than if you're actually in the product. So what we looked at next is, you know, what category of companies tend to lead with demos in the sales led model? And it's no surprise that a lot of the categories of software you see here are those with high barrier to entry in terms of setup. So you look at a compliance tool, you look at a supply chain tool or ERP or MarTech tool, oftentimes they have higher barrier to entry. So it's not as easy to set the user up on a quick seven day trial if they have to do a deep integration. So those sorts of companies tend to lead with the sales led model. Now there are others in the space, of course, like legal tech, ed tech, and others that have very similar approaches. So what we wanted to, to look at next is, is there a way that you can merge the two approaches? So if you had a trial on your website, did you also have a demo or talk to sales option on your website? So we come back through our analysis and found that if you had a trial on your website, around 63% of those companies that have a trial also had a demo option. And this, when we're looking at it more, this takes total sense. It essentially allows prospects to go in their own swim lanes. If a startup that wants to come into your, your product and, and play around, they can totally do that by signing up for a trial. But if you have an enterprise customer that wants to loop in other people in their evaluation, that wants to talk through role-based access, SSO, and those typical enterprise security concerns, that is something that can be handled through a talk to sales call to action. So allowing that hybrid approach is something we've seen a lot of companies take to accommodate project like growth while also allowing those buyers that want that human-oriented approach to do so. We've also seen around 33%, or 36%, excuse me, of the folks just have a purely trial option. And those tend to lean towards very simple, easy to use products. So what we did is we put together the CTA range and we'll provide this as well, but it's really helpful for folks to be able to see what are my peers doing? So if you're in the project management space, what is the common call to action and what is that for ed tech, legal tech? And so you'll see on this spectrum where it is commonly found for folks to, to land based on their vertical of software. That they're currently in. And it goes all back to those few points we discussed before barriers to entry to, to usage, and what is the go to market notion for a lot of these folks? Is this something they can instantly sign up for, or is there a little more challenge to seeing value? Okay. So, with that, I wanted to talk through an emerging um, early product touch point. And this is an interactive product tour. So this combines a lot of the um, benefits of that trial model while also incorporating um, some of the challenges with the demo web model. So if you have a, a, a sales or demo web model, you have to have humans in the funnel to show the product. But at the same time, you don't necessarily want to support them um, with you if you offer a trial. So a product tour is actually a really compelling alternative. So folks can get into the product, they can click around, they can see how it works, but they're not signing up for a full trial. They don't need you know, a full 14 day evaluation period just to see how the software works. And this is especially compelling for folks with a sales led go to market motion because people can't see the product until maybe one to two calls if they're lucky. So this allows folks to get right into the product um, without having to do a lot of setup or integrations just to see how it works. So related to this, we can see where product tours win and where product tours fail. And there's a few considerations that we have for making product tours a success. So one is if generic data works for you and your company, a product tour could, could work really well. You want to show something that's generalizable. And of course you can personalize it with different workflows, persona based, whether it's uh, feature based, you can really have the depth of those workflows available. But at the end of the day, you want to make sure the, the data can speak to them and it doesn't require specific data entry on their end. You also, we also wanted to, to share that for prospects that have hands-on experiences um, as an important part of the evaluation process is an area where product tours make a lot of sense. So of course, there's going to be prospects that always want to get hands-on. And I would actually argue that in today's buying process, 
getting hands-on in the sales process is becoming a requisite. I would say 10 years ago, most buyers didn't expect that, but we've seen a seismic shift in the consumerization of enterprise software specifically, so that if you are buying software today, you expect to see how it works. You expect to click around, you expect to go into the product before you sign that 20K annual contract. So getting people hands-on is something that we've seen, especially um, in, in the B2B world these last few years. The other area where product tours are success is if setup or training is needed to see product value. So if your, if your product has deep integrations, it requires a lot of hand-holding to get started, it may make sense to have a product tour that's guided end-to-end -end so you can show that specific functionality that you want that gets people excited, while also allowing them to experience it in a very locked down way. So they're not setting up a trial. They don't have to go through the extensive integration period. They're just looking at how the software works. At the same time, there are areas where product tours may not make sense. So if your product is in a limited scope, if there isn't much value um, being able to be shown, and some examples include um, like identity management solutions, like an Okta or Auth-O, it doesn't necessarily make sense to, to have a product tour if most of the, the product is behind the scenes. And lastly, if products are able to, to instantly show value, a product tour might not also make sense. So where this comes in handy is Gmail. If you can sign up for the product in three minutes, you can send your email to your friend. You probably don't need a product tour to show how that works. So those are some different considerations that we've seen folks take as they've approached this new emerging good market model. And so one of the things that we'll look at is not my customers. They're one of Nomadic's customers today. And one of the things that they did is they kept the call to action on their landing page consistent. So you notice right now it's try it free. And what they did is they swapped out the trial for an interactive product tour. There's other areas in the page that talk about the trial. But for this one specifically, they, they swapped it out and they saw a few interesting things with, when the product was implemented. So number one is they saw more enterprise customers come through. And after conversations with them, it became clear that if you're an enterprise company, spending four to five hours setting up a CRM is not something that you're willing to do. And there's concerns around confidentiality of data. So they've seen a lot of enterprise leads come into the funnel because it's easy to experience the product without having to set up the full trial. Secondly, the, the other benefit they saw is that sales cycles are shorter. So when people can experience the product before chatting with sales, the end-to-end -end cycle is a lot shorter because that first call can be use case oriented rather than the harbor tour. Here's how it works. So allowing people to experience the product is the downstream effect of shortening that sales cycle end-to-end -end based on the conversations and some metrics that we gathered from them. Now, there's definitely industries where product code makes sense. There's definitely industries where trials and demos make sense. So there's, of course, some individual considerations to be made. But we hope this analysis is helpful to provide some high-level context on how companies are approaching early prospect experiences when different go-to-market notions make sense for you. So with that, I wanted to share a quick offer that we're putting together for the Product Marketing Alliance community. You go to nevatic.com slash PMA offer, and we'll actually build out an interactive demo for you. So if you wanted to explore what that interactive demo or product tour looks like on your website, we're happy to do that. Feel free to, to go ahead and submit the form on that landing page and we'll, we'll get you set up. But at this point, thank you guys so much for taking the time to, to go through um, this presentation with me today. We'd love to open the floor for any questions that folks have. Absolutely. Thanks, Neil. That was a super informative session. We've got a couple of questions here that I'm just going to run through. Um, so yeah, do you have, can you share a few best practices for A-B testing the use of demos? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great one. So one of the things that could be helpful is selectively including call to actions at different points in the page. So we've seen some customers, rather than swapping out every CTA all at once to a different, different one, maybe it's try product or maybe it's demo, um, swapping out specific ones and on a use case page. So we've seen customers that target perhaps more senior leaders say, hey, on this persona, that's the executive page, we're just going to swap out that to the demo option. And for folks that are on the, you know, the startup page, swap out that to the trial option. So I would say more targeted approaches towards experimentation has yielded results for some, some users. 
future so far. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, and how would you approach product tours when your buyer persona and user personas are different? That's interesting, yeah. So if your buyer persona and user personas are separate, I think it'd be important to include in the product tour optionality for both. So we've seen folks, and you know, we can go into it to more detail, but there is oftentimes a way to include different routes or adventures that a user could go on. So maybe you go into the you know, persona route that's the end user for an HR tool so they can see what it looks like to develop a performance plan. But then you could also have another tour that walks to the admin level of, hey, how do you manage all these 50 users in the platform? And how do you do things like access? So incorporating different workflows would be a good approach to that. But I think it is a really good consideration to have here. Definitely, I guess it's just about identifying who those key stakeholders are as well and kind of working backwards. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I guess, is there any final call for questions? I've keeping my eyes peeled on the chat. But um, yeah, I know you shared that um, offer with us, which is fantastic. Um, but yeah, if people wanted to kind of connect with you further or find out more, um, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Yeah, no, thanks, Rose. Um, so that PMA offer is an awesome one for taking the next step. I'm also available on LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me, shoot me a message, and we'd love to, to connect here. Excited to, to keep learning from this community. Amazing. Well, yeah, if there's any last minute questions that you might have missed out, feel free to connect with Neil directly. Um, and we do have a couple more awesome sessions lined up for you right now. So we are diving right into Fireside Chat with the legend that is Bree Bunzel from Dropbox. So stay tuned and thanks again, Neil. Thank you. <laughs>
Whether you're joining a Product Marketing Alliance event for the first time, or if you're a seasoned regular, welcome to the second edition of the Customer Marketing Summit. Before we dive into the day's content, we just want to say a huge thank you to our sponsors, partners, speakers, and you, our lovely audience. From wherever you're watching in the world, we're sure you'll enjoy the sessions from our incredible lineup. With expert presentations, specialist talks, and deep dive panel sessions on the agenda, you are in for a real treat today. To get the most out of these sessions, please ensure you are sharing your feedback and asking all your questions in the comments section, and our speakers will be answering them throughout the day. After the event, a great place to continue the conversation is in the customer marketing channel in the PMA Slack community. If you aren't already a member, hop on over and come and join the discussion. And if that's still not enough, then why not become a PMA Pro member and benefit from unlimited access to exclusive templates, frameworks, and our entire library of videos and slide decks from all our events. So with all that to come, let's dive right into the next session. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And today, we have uh, Brie Bonzel. You know, we're going to be talking about customer marketing, which is hot and new in the SaaS world. It means many things to many people. So let's learn about how to get into and how to excel in customer marketing from one of the best, Brie Bonzel. Well, Brie, who is Brie Bonzel um, for everybody on the call? Yeah, um, born and raised in San Francisco, moved out to Australia about seven years ago. I currently live in Bondi Beach. I guess we can go on about my life journey, but one of my passions is ocean swimming. Um, I'm also a really big fan of ethnic food, but also the Sydney brekkie culture, which is breakfast. Um, so if you're ever visiting Sydney, I'm happy to give you recommendations, but I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you, Sai. Yeah, so we're going to talk about the two areas. First, what it means to be in customer marketing for somebody new in, in it. And the second half, we'll talk about how to be successful and the path to success. So Brie, what does customer marketing, we've used it mul multiple times, what does that mean to you? Yeah, great question. So I think of customer marketing as evangelizing the customer first experience thinking about what they want and what they need to be successful in their jobs to be done and their tasks. I think many times organizations think from a revenue first perspective um, or an upsell perspective, instead of thinking about where they're at in the journey and what they need most. Um, I think it's also a combination of building really strong, deep relationships with your customers around the world and being 10 steps ahead of them. So actually knowing what they want in the future so that you can go and build and solve for those needs. That is precise. Okay, so we, there is a few different components to it. Um, how did you put this into practice at Dropbox, for example? What does that look like as a, as a program? Um, and if you can give us the history, where did it start? Yeah, it's funny because I, it came, I, I felt it came serendipitously to me. Uh, I would say customer marketing at Dropbox is a relatively new function in the organization. As you mentioned, it's a new hot topic with SaaS and more and more companies are starting to develop these customer marketing roles and functions, which is exciting to see. Um, but I was working on a customer advisory board program last year. And as I was building this, uh, we were building customer advisory boards in each region around the world in each of our key markets. And our, um, the CMO at the time had tapped me on the shoulder and said, have you ever thought of doing a customer marketing role? And I said, yes, without even knowing <laughs> fully what it was. I just thought it would be a cool opportunity. I guess you just say yes and figure it out. Um, but one of the things that we realized as a company at the time was that we weren't showing enough love to our existing customers. Um, it was also an interesting time in the history of Dropbox because we had started to move away from just being a single product of Dropbox, as you guys all know and love today, into this multi-product platform. And we felt it was really important to ensure our customers were a part of that journey with us 
not getting confused or not losing them through that process in our evolution. Um, so one of the things that we thought about was, okay, if we're building a customer marketing function, there's two components. I think the first is that it's not like customer marketing elements didn't exist in parts of the company already today. Right. They were living in different pockets. So you had a content team doing customer stories. You had an onboarding team doing all the emails. Um, and what was happening though, is there wasn't this cross collaboration coordination. So as we always said, our silos were showing to the customer. Mm -hmm. So you'd be getting all these emails around one type of messaging and you'd have in product prompts about a whole different topic. And so there needed to be this like coordination, which was like the first component for things like, let's say onboarding and adoption that exists today, but at least ensuring that this consistent message is clear throughout all those channels at the right time in the right place. Um, and then the second component was building a lot of areas of customer marketing that we really didn't have that we should. And a lot of that came from just talking to a lot of great customer marketers. Um, and things like this included advocacy and customer feedback loops. So advocacy, advocacy includes like, you know, who are your top customers? Who are the ones that are going off and cheering from the rooftops about how great your product is? And then your customer feedback loop is something that we're still figuring out, which is how do you take all the feedback you're getting from customers and bringing it back into the organization to influence your product and your strategy. Um, so I would say it's been a journey, <laughs> not always yeah. easy, as we'll get into in a moment. Um, but I do feel like it's been really exciting to see the organization starting to rally behind the customer and think about them a bit more proactively and holistically. You know, that, that's that's so interesting. You bring up two things that resonate with me uh, as a product marketer in cybersecurity, it is extremely difficult sometimes to get customer stories to speak up on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, customers can be a bit reticent um, telling you about what defenses they have. Um, and so sometimes it can be very hard. The second part is the fact that customer, ad uh, not even customer advocacy, but the various functions of customer marketing can be done by different groups. Yeah. And so we have had multiple cases in our firm where we've hit up the same customer from multiple angles around, uh, you know, just trying to understand their product usage, their happiness, uh, mm -hmm. NPS surveys, et cetera. So very exactly. much resonates. Yeah, it takes um, the village. Her. I plus one to everything you just said. And I think the key to this is also not having an ego about it when you're leading this. You can't own all these functions and there's no way your team will have the bandwidth to talk to all 500 million plus in our case, customers, you need a village and you need a cross-functional team that's solid at kind of understanding the mission. So I hear you. Uh, I know I didn't, I, we didn't have this in our um, pre-talk notes, but I did want to ask you about, it seemed like the CMO had a vision as well yes. to tap you on your shoulder to say, hey, maybe customer marketing is something um, that's there. Maybe Can you speak about how a leader um, there can, you know, mm -hmm create that for, for uh, somebody new coming in? Yeah, absolutely. And, and this CMO was incredible at really understanding the customer needs ahead of time. It was like, she's a mind reader, um, but she also um, was very data driven. And so she actually could understand some of the key areas we were struggling in or had opportunities. Like, you know, maybe we can even improve the churn rate or why are people leaving or we don't know all these things. And so there was a lot of this hypotheses building with the leader and I think finding the right people that can help solve and go find those answers and those solutions. So the leadership and the tops down is so, so critical and important. And I would say it's a bit more difficult when the leader doesn't really understand customer first mindset and they're just like yep, revenue, yep. revenue, revenue. Um, and I think a lot of that comes again from the data. How can you improve some of the metrics that you're thinking about, but really then how do you actually talk to those customers to get that clarity on, on what they're looking for? Yeah, that, that makes so much sense. Um, so for somebody who's listening to this and kind of excited by all the things that you said, all the responsibilities that are there to tie together, how can someone get into this space uh, new? What are the various avenues that you've seen? Yeah. I found for me, at least in my experience, that I always was interacting with customer related projects, whether it was mm. being able to be a part of the alphas and the betas for the launches or interviewing customers for a story or 
at the time pre-COVID going out in the field and actually talking to these customers. Um, so I, I just found that really exciting for me. And it was something that brought me a lot of energy because it reminds you and regrounds you and why you're there. Why are you spending all these hours to build this product? There's humans on the other end that are benefiting from this and you hope that they're benefiting from it. And so that's your job to go and figure that out. So I think my first piece of advice would be to stay close to any projects that engage with the customer to any degree. One thing I also did, which really helped get the organization and leadership on board was we did this post-sale illustrative customer journey. And what that means is like, what is the dream state of the customer? So like day one, Sire using Dropbox, what do we want you to feel? What do we want you to be using? And day five, day 10, you know, what do we want that experience to be? And then do a comparison of where the current state is at. Are we there? Is Sai really feeling that way on day one? Or is he actually really disappointed or annoyed that he's getting so many emails when he's just trying to get used to Dropbox? There's so many different things to think about in that opportunity of where you can get to. Um, and so that was a really interesting exercise for us. And then I would also add that one thing that's helped me build this function is talking to so many customer marketers in other parts of the organization. Events like this customer marketing summit are so valuable for that. I've learned more from just people's failures and things they've done wrong and things they wish they learned and how they use their budget more effectively. And I basically created like a SWOT analysis for customer marketing and shared it to the leaders in the organization and said, this is what best in class looks like. And this is where we're currently at. There's so much opportunity. And that starts to build the momentum for having that baked into the strategy and the experience um, and the team that we need to help build that. Okay, so you've gotten to a bit of what success looks like in in the role as well. So let's get into that a bit more to understand. So you talked about some of the gap analysis that you have to do, Mm -hmm. but as a customer marketer, what are some of the key components or skills um, that I would need to be to be amazing at it and to be somebody like a Brie Bunzel 2.0? I would say there's five big things. Um, The first one is curiosity, not only about the customer, but external inspiration, new ways of thinking about our customer experience that uh, we haven't thought of before. The second is diversity, not just cultural diversity or where you're from or your ethnicity, but also diversity of thought, new perspectives, new backgrounds, um, new working styles, uh, different strengths. Um, we recently did a strengths finders for my team and all of us are different colors on the strengths finders, which is awesome because not only are we different underrepresented minorities on our team, but we also represent different styles of thinking and, and embracing that. The third would be collaboration, being able to bring people together. As I mentioned, it is the cross-functional glue for a lot of these massive projects and really being able to learn fast with the team and build And and again, put our egos aside and think first about what is the best thing for the customer, not just what is the best for the Dropbox revenue. The fourth is customer empathy. Uh, This is something that takes time to build, but it's really just being really passionate about the customer and everything that they're doing, really understanding their pains and their challenges and, and putting yourself in their shoes so that you can actually build products to solve those key challenges. And then the fifth would be strong interpersonal and relationship building skills. You're going to be doing so much engagement internally, but also with customers to get them on the journey um, and where you want them to be heading. If you want them to be evangelizing your product, that's a whole process to get them on that as well. Um, So I would say again, curiosity, diversity, collaboration, customer empathy, and strong interpersonal skills. I love it. You've simplified it down to like five. These are big challenges for anybody to work on, but they're groups that Um, folks can work on. Now, with that also comes, given the breadth of the role, Mm -hmm. not all days are going to be roses. Um, So can you tell us about the challenging times that you're faced and what what it takes to overcome that? Yeah, absolutely. It's messy. I mean, I'll be the first to say it. There are so many things that you're still figuring out. Um, I remember one of um, my recent teammates was onboarding and she's like, wow, we're still like building processes. And I I said, look, you're building the plane as you fly. When you're building a new function, you're proving it out. You're also trying to get early wins for the customers and for your organization. So 
It's not always easy. I would say it takes patience and it takes time to build a new function, to evangelize it internally and get folks on board. What is the value? What is the impact you're bringing to customers as well as you know the overall business? And then the second challenge or pain point for at least for us is because it was a new function, there weren't the right tools in place. So there's been this whole new journey of what are the right tools to you know, engage with our customers and um, measure success of things that are new metrics like influenced ARR or advocacy. These are things we never really measured before, but clearly have an impact into the entire journey um, of the customer. So I would say those two are the big things to think about, but it's not pretty. I mean, even at the biggest organizations I've chatted with some of my peers, they're still not perfectly pretty under the hood and that's okay. I think the big thing is to just show up authentically and, you know, with the customer first mindset to those customers. And so at least that their needs are being met first and foremost in those engagements with them. So you, you've spoken a bit, you just touched upon from some of the peers. Would love to learn who helped you through this, um, this marketing journey. Yeah. Uh, you've already mentioned the CMO, but who did you learn from, whether peers, or mentors of other, you know, yeah. from other areas? As I mentioned earlier, I think diversity of thought includes exposing yourself to so many types of people in the world and not just marketers. Um, obviously I've had managers and mentors and obviously staying close to the customers themselves. Some of my most impactful conversations have been with customer marketers that are my peers that maybe are five years ahead of me or 10 years ahead of me. So I can kind of say, hey, I'm in this awkward you know, phase two of building this out. Where do I begin? What's the first thing I should start with? I would say as well, though, a lot of the things that I've learned have also come from non-marketers or non-customers, which are just cool brands that are having great customer experiences. And now that people like friends of mine are starting to know what my role is, or even my partner, for example, you are getting these emails for it of like, this was such a cool email. I just thought, or like, I didn't know that they knew this about me or, you know, all of a sudden you're looking on LinkedIn and you're starting to follow these companies that are doing amazing things with customer marketing, where the customers are sending photos of themselves delighted by an experience or a package that they receive for being an advocate. Those are all the different inspiration that you get throughout this journey and being open-minded and exposed to just not just your organization and your own echo chamber is super important. I, I feel like that's such an important thing because I, I think back in my own journey, um, I was in product management before this. Um, yeah. It's now half a decade ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then got into product marketing primarily through coaching from somebody who was in sales engineering. Yeah. Um, nothing to do with my function. And in fact, this person was in the organization, but then I left and really took a lot of the guidance from that person throughout after that. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, it's sometimes in various other places um, from other random conversations that this, this can often come. Yep. Um, yeah. And I think the, it ties back to sometimes for me, the challenging times. Um, and so you, you mentioned the areas around collaboration mm -hmm. and the fact that it's a teamwork. I think it's, it's it can't emphasize it enough how when you're in a new function, um, collaboration and teamwork to build it up. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody knows what you're doing exactly. uh, otherwise. Exactly. Um, did it, actually, can you tell us more about what it now looks like in terms of now people understand customer marketing? What is, can you give us like an example in, in when you saw kind of the light bulb in an organization uh, around customer marketing? Yeah, definitely. I would say, to be honest, it's still a work in progress. Like even one and a half years in, we're still, um, my old CEO always said repetition doesn't ruin the prayer. Like we're still going <laughs> out and saying the same thing over and over again. Um, one thing that's really helped in the process as we've built this function is doing roadshows. And I'd highly recommend that. So twice a year, we build out kind of the H1 strategy, the H2 strategy, all the key tactics and projects, and then have a chance to open it up for conversation with each of the cross-functional teams. How can we better interlock? How do we better collaborate with one another? And so the roadshows have actually been really interesting in that process. Um, but to answer your question, I think where the organization is now, some of the early wins that I've seen be really exciting is, for example, we just launched a brand new onboarding 
experience. So in the first 30 days of the customer and the previous experience was very much focused on, Hey, you just bought Dropbox now buy this now buy that now buy that. (laughs) And the new version is very much focused on a customer first mindset of like, Hey, are you okay? How are you onboarding? Like, what things are you missing? Have you thought about this feature? We know that you're a media customer. Have you thought about this media tool? Um, So having that all of a sudden changed this idea around not only having to focus on revenue was like a big aha for the team. And obviously the revenue will come once you solve these customer challenges. The second thing I'd mention is um, we recently launched our first customer advocacy program, and we've now recruited about 15 customer advocates. And we have this poster we created internally with all their faces, all their locations, all of their Uh, verticals that they're focused on. And what's so exciting about it is now people are saying, oh my God, we have an advocate for this space in this region. And I'd love to chat with them because we're building this feature that solves for them exactly. And all of a sudden you're seeing people internally get so excited about the fact that they can leverage these customers, tell their stories. And equally, these customers are super honored to be advocates. They use the product day in and day out. They get a chance to be exposed to our leaders as they're influencing the future of Dropbox. And they also kind of get a chance to, I guess we call them, make them famous through the process. Yeah. So yeah, that was like the biggest insight actually we learned is that a lot of these customers, depending on their size, but many small business, mid-market, even solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, they would be so thrilled if Dropbox did an article on their customer story, because we have a massive platform. We have posting on our website or sharing their social, their story on our social channels, all of a sudden that 7 million plus eyeballs around the world looking at this mom and pop baker that's innovating in all these cool new ways with Dropbox. So I think that's something to keep in mind with customer marketing is how can you make sure that the customer is benefiting from it? And a lot of the ways that happens tends to be making them famous. Um, One quick example I'll share with you is that we had a customer, um, Wayne, he worked for the uh, National Rugby League as a media specialist. He loved Dropbox and he started presenting at uh, different webinars and speaking engagements that we had, and as well as he did a customer story with us. And through that process, he built such a close relationship with us in that whole journey so much so that we actually had a job opening for a solutions architect, <laughs> someone who loves Dropbox, uses Dropbox day in and day out. And That's you know, amazing. all of a sudden he applied for this role, got the role, and he actually just started last week with us. So not to say wow. that every customer advocate wants their end state to be Dropbox, but it wasn't a really exciting experience and example of how being close to the customer and you know also having them have all these opportunities to become famous can enhance their career. And I've heard many other companies do this and other great examples with Adobe um, and their Marketo Engage program as well. So I think I've seen a lot of great examples of this. Salesforce does it an incredible job. Their customers are the heroes. They're on stage as trailblazers with the CEO and Mark Bennett. Yeah, every time. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So I think there's a lot more you can be doing. (laughs) Okay, so we're gonna run out of time. Yes. So I wanna bring us together um, for just get, getting everybody listening and viewing this, some actionable tips from all that we have talked about as people want to grow their careers in customer marketing and into customer marketing, any actionable tips that you might have? I'd say the first and foremost is to proactively build some tangible skills um, and frameworks that can help you stay close to the customer, not only identifying who they are, but also identifying the challenges, the opportunities, and bringing that back to the business for strategy. So two quick things on that. The first is design thinking. If you haven't yet heard of design thinking, I would take a mini course. There's plenty online that cover it. And it's basically a framework to understand the customer, build and solve for those key challenges in different minimum viable products and actually help enhance their experience, um, whether they're trying to get a job done or whatever they're trying to do with your tool or your service. The second skill I would say is also things like I mentioned earlier, like customer advisory boards. They're a great way to get really close to the customer and understand what things you may not be solving for yet. 
I last year uh, with the Product Marketing Alliance created a CAB masterclass. CAB stands for Customer Advisory Board mm-hmm. masterclass. And it's a great opportunity to just work at your own pace and start to learn the ropes of what it takes to understand your customers and how that actually influences the overall organizational strategy. Um, the second tip I would give, and I said this before, is relationships are everything. The quality of your relationships um, or the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your relationships and your business life is no different. And so the more that you invest in those relationships with your customers or your cross-functional stakeholders, the more richer that experience will be. Um, and I truly live and breathe by that. Um, you know, you and I have formed a relationship through this and yeah. you know, there's so many benefits that have come from that. And, you know, same with customers that I've met that have gone on to like build amazing careers through just being a part of our Dropbox ecosystem or advocacy program. So I think just keep those relationships strong and keep opening your mind to building new ones. And I know people have gone through this whole role of like Zoom fatigue and whatnot, but having a virtual coffee even every two weeks with someone new can change your entire trajectory of your career with inspiration and uh, ideas. I love it. So I'm excited. Um, There's a lot of good stuff here. So thank you, Bree. And thanks for everybody tuning in. Uh, This is Sai Chavli from uh, Product Marketing at Proofpoint signing off. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Gal. I'm CEO and co-founder at Cravocate. So excited to have you here on the Customer Marketing Summit this year. It's great. So many people are meeting together, sharing best practices, knowledge, and networking. I recommend that you find at least one thing that you can implement even in Q4 this year in your company, which would be great. Um, I also invite you to join our Customer Marketing Slack group together with HubSpot. Just reach out to us and we'll add you in. And to come to my session later today is going to talk about seven things I've learned from some of the greatest customer marketers out there. Enjoy.
Hello, wherever you're joining us from today, we want to say a huge welcome to our global community. We hope that you're enjoying the Customer Marketing Summit. I also want to send out an extra special thank you to all our sponsors, partners, and participants who together have made this event possible. We are also delighted to welcome Crowdbooker as our headline sponsor today. Their sessions are bursting with insights to help you level up. But remember, the learning doesn't stop here. If you haven't already, you can upgrade your pass to include access to all today's sessions on demand with our Access All Areas Pass. Or you can become a PMA Pro member and benefit from unlimited access to exclusive templates, frameworks, and our entire library of videos and slide decks from our events. And remember, have your questions at the ready. Simply post your question in the comments section and get awesome advice from an expert in the field. What's not to love about that? So now, on to the next talk. Welcome everyone to our panel on how to increase product adoption and communicate new releases effectively. Why don't we go around the room and do a quick introduction uh, about yourself um, and where you're based. So we'll start with you, Alex, the top. Hey, Kim. Um, hi everyone, so excited to be here. Um, Rose and team at PMA always put on such a great show, uh, great event, especially virtual. Um, my name is Alex Connors. I run customer marketing for a company called NS1. Um, we are in the application traffic routing space. Uh, customers include companies like Roblox, Dropbox, uh, Zscaler. Um, I am based in New York City, um, and but my role touches customers globally and super excited to be here. Cool, Kanishka. Hi everyone, I'm Kanishka Pandit. I'm a product marketing manager in Zscaler and um, I'm responsible for one of the products that we that's part of the platform and uh, very excited to be here because I see a lot of people from the cybersecurity space in, as part of Product Marketing Alliance. And uh, as Alex mentioned, it's a great show to gain more knowledge. And I'm hoping that this panel, everyone in this panel and outside sort of learn from each other so that we can do a better job at what we're doing on a uh, customer marketing uh, platform. Awesome. I'm Kimberly Lim. I'm based in Auckland, New Zealand. I look after the marketing function here at, uh, at EasyVet, a cloud-based business software for veterinary professionals around the world. So a very targeted niche market, so to speak. Um, I don't think any of our clients would be watching this, but there's a lot of concepts that we can we use that, that you know, we could share throughout to any product marketing team. So at EasyVet, we're a small but growing marketing team. Uh, so I do look after or do do product partnerships and, and content. Uh, they all fall under my remit as well. So yeah, very excited to be here with Alex and Kanishka. Uh, so during this webinar or this panel, please feel free to pop in any questions that you have throughout. And I like I love doing this when I do webinars. I, I invite uh, everyone in the audience to put in their title and also where they're based. And yeah, let's get started. So one of the first questions we have is what advice would you give to customer marketing, marketing teams who are at the beginning of their journey to build a community? Um, Alex, would you like to take up Sure. This one? <laughs> so this is a tough one because it kind of depends on a few things, right? Where your customers are based, um, how they access your products and how they use their products, and then also where your company is, right? So the first thing, you know, every time we go down the community journey um, in any of the companies that I've been with, the first conversation or the question we ask ourselves is, are we ready to staff it? And the reason for that is, community can be the single greatest place for your customers to land, to build their networks, interact with each other, experience your brand, right? Not just your product, but your brand, your people, your teams across the business. But if you don't have someone to properly staff it and ensure that all of those questions are being answered, it can very quickly turn into a rabbit hole of, 
ooh, we were totally unprepared for this and now we don't really know what to do. So that's the first thing. The other thing that we've, we also consider when you're talking about the community, the journey to starting a community is, what is your customer journey, right? So what is the customer's experience with not just your products, but all of your teams? The first experience they have with your brand all the way through to when they get to that portion where they become an advocate and then they're, you know, a loyalist, if you will. Um, but, you know, it, again, it kind of depends on not just where you are in the, in the size of your business, but also where you are in engaging with your customers customers. Kanishka, I'm sure you have a little bit more feedback on this just because of the size of Zscaler and the nature yeah. of your of your customers. Yeah, and I totally agree with you in terms of identifying the customer journey. You really want to see where where which part of the customer journey is the community belongs at, you know, uh, the engagement with the early adopters of the product, whether it's, you know, new feature, um, that's a great place to sort of bring the customers in, have their feedback. Um, and also it's out in the open, right? So that's, um, you have to have that kind of trust with your user uh, in a community. So I absolutely agree with the understanding the journey and fitting that piece in the community. Uh, in my previous roles, actually as a much smaller organization, because the questions around how do we start the community, right? I think Product Marketing Alliance, I've drawn a lot from their building the community early on, because um, I was trying to build a community for digital merchandisers and you know starting small is a great place you build a one-on-one -on -one or like almost a one to ten people relationship and build from there on uh, and then make that online um, just tactically speaking what does that translate to from when you build that community in person or as small events that's local to then taking it online and making it global yeah you know you mentioned like people connecting, right? One of the things that we found in the pandemic is opening a Zoom room and pulling some customers in. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm sure attendees gathered, right? We have Kim in Auckland. Kanishka, you're based on the West Coast, but I think you said you're in Toronto today. I'm in New York. So like our networks have networks, no pun intended, working in DNS, um, <laughs> have expanded, right? Because we just kind of align with time zones and customers are now able to engage at a more uh, personal level without having to beg for funds to go to an event or go to a user conference yeah. or the opportunistic networking, if you will, which is also a nice residual effect. Totally, and I would I would chime in here and, and add that um, the choosing the right platform for where you grow this community is really important. Um, with the company I'm with, EasyBet, right now, we're very, very lucky uh, to have uh, a Facebook community that was grown actually organically by one of our customers. And uh, it's a good balance between um, managing all the queries and, and questions and tips given there uh, on, on our end, but also kind of letting them do their own thing. So we just need to have our voice somehow yeah. in there as an official uh, voice so that things don't go awry. But it was, it was really nice to have that sort of customer um, that, that would, would proactively go and build their own. So that's, that's what we have that's, that's really lucky. We're it's trying to build the a ultimate yeah. advocate. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Uh, I just think we're, yeah, again, we're very lucky to have veterinary professionals who are just very passionate. They're generally a very passionate industry. You know, they love animals. That's why they got into the industry. So it, so it, that, that really helps us in, in that sense. Um, I know it's maybe a bit trickier for you guys because it's really hard to have, um, I guess, active users who are or interested or would rave about networks, but I'm sure there are, there are You'd some You'd be surprised. That, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, <laughs> we're trying to build a, a separate one and we're using Slack. However, that's a platform that's not used. So we are used frequently by our audience or our customers. So it's a bit more challenging to, to, to have more people going on there and using it as opposed to Facebook, because everyone's yeah. on Facebook. Um, what, what platforms do you use or, or think or are thinking of using? 
Uh, right now we have our own website as part of the community uh -huh. building, but I think that, you know, you have to identify who your audience is. Um, Slack may be great for product marketers because we're usually very chatty and, you know, uh, very out, outgoing, I would say, uh, and very open to asking questions, getting feedback. But if you understand the kind of audience, what kind of platforms do they usually use? Because um, the people that I interact with that right now are network admins, you know, IT, um, that are usually, they, they don't like very open, you know, conversations out in the open. They don't want their questions to be out in the open. So I think building that community, starting to know who your audience is, is great. Our Zscaler community is fairly big, but I do know that there are other companies that do, uh, as you said, Facebook, right? Reddit is a big piece that uh, has all these questions and it can go a little bit out of control, but just knowing that people engage when, when they're total tech uh, into technology, you know, Reddit is somewhere they engage a lot. And if you can afford to build your own community within your website, that, that would be a great forum to, to explore more conversations. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Ideal to have it's ideal to have a community forum within our software, our platform. Yeah. Because um, then you get all that metadata for SEO and the marketing. Yeah, totally. He really loves and you. Then, <laughs> yeah. So uh, we do have another uh, kind of community in a way on uh, within our um, software, but it's more a feature request forum where it's very much. Um, product geared so the product team would look after that as opposed to marketing um but there isn't that nice oh banter you know and and helpfulness that the the the, the, the community actually brings in well Kim, yeah. you know you kind of you kind of read my mind because the other question i was going to ask you is one yeah. of the, a lot of our customers like slack um Personally, I'm not a huge Slack fan because there's so much going on all the time. Um, and a lot of people use Teams. Uh, I think Microsoft 365 with their expansion, especially in COVID, we saw a lot of people switch mm -hmm. to leveraging Teams. And it'll be interesting to see who wins that race with the Salesforce acquisition, right, of Slack. Right. But, um, you know, one of the things with community and with Slack in particular, I use Slack for some customer advisory board channels. And the question that always comes up is what happens to support, right? In communities, if they're not kind of combined, right? Like your knowledge base and your support ticketing system, if they're not all in one environment, then does it become more of like a triage center, right? Yeah. No intended as your and consumer, <laughs> our doctors, our vets, yeah. <laughs> does it become a support triage place or does it become a place where people really, really build community together? In the B2B space, I will say, I think there is, and Kanishka, if you disagree and you or you aren't familiar, tell me to shut up, but B2B on the infrastructure and network side, solar winds, and it pains me because they're an ex-competitor from previous life, but their community just is, they've done a phenomenal job with their community. Um, and I think you, on the marketing side, you see it with like HubSpot and even Marketo to a degree did a really, really good job with community building. Um, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah, totally. It all comes down to, to the staffing that you made at, at the first point, the staffing of it, whether or not um, exactly. it can be manned. And like with our community, if any queries that is a support type query we, we would actually say go go back to your ticket um and then i think people in the within the community will get the gist of it and be like okay this is not a support forum this is <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a help forum <laughs> for, exactly. or community forum yeah not not a help uh well how do i do this and uh <laughs> or, or support like i'm having problem I'm having issues fix it <laughs> yeah yeah um another thing i would recommend uh, when building a, a community is, is determining the output or the activity you want to, to do and not do everything and like how, what you can you leverage your community best for. So there's things like case studies, reviews on, on online, online reviews, especially uh, testimonials, I guess just, you know, two sentence um, testimonies you can put on your site uh, to user generated content, to referral programs and depending on uh, the, the product that you do in influences as well. So uh, a tip would be to 
prioritize what you want to collect. Normally people would start with case studies, uh, reviews and testimonials and put, I guess, a KPI on a number, a number to aim for, say you want 20 online reviews over the next three months. And then that will help, that strategy will help you determine what activity you would do to get that number. And similar, like another KPI you could set is two in-depth case studies over the next three months. Um, anything you want and what whatever capacity you guys have accordingly. Are you going to measure it? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. apologize for the background noise. It just started pouring in New York. So I'm going to put headphones in so that I have this like my apartment has so many windows, which is such a novelty in the city that it's really New loud. York. <laughs> We don't hear it, so you're fine. <laughs> okay, good. I'm going to switch to wired headphones. Very vintage of me. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, Kim, you, you raised the right thing in terms of how do you use the community? What's the KPI? Um, I'll give you an example of what we're doing, starting to do with the community as part of product marketing, right? We This is an avenue for us to put out the message of the product, the new things that we're releasing or an event even that we're running for existing customers. And so it's a great forum to connect to connect with your customers for whatever you're running. You know, For example, webinars that are focused on like generating leads. That's one thing that we do outside of like customer marketing. But also if you're trying to upsell new features or new products and community is a great place to start because you know that there is some everyone's eyes are on it. You just get, have to get their attention. And we, we know how to do that, right? Uh, try to get yeah. their attention, like make it, make it interesting. But community is a great avenue to put it out there and then have them consume that content um, and then gauge the interest. So I, that like raises a big, I'm taking notes because great thing to learn as I'm here in <laughs> real time. But um, that leads me to another question. Kim, I'm kind of stealing your thunder here on the next question, but can you share, <laughs> how do you balance the difference between where to ask the question when, right? So then one thing that we talk about a lot is products like Pendo for your in-product communication if you're delivered as a SaaS. So how do you differentiate? So, okay, beta. You, you're as a product marketer with a product team, you want to go to the customer base to get some beta testing on a new version. Do how do you differentiate between in-app communications, community communications, or does it all look the same? Um, or is it omni-channel in a situation like that, if you will? That's yeah, it's a great question. I think you strike a balance, right? Especially for a beta program, you're trying to get as many customers as possible, but you also don't want to exceed the number. Like if it's a product that's really good that everyone wants to have be first uh, early adopters on, it's really hard to put it in the community and have everyone say, yes, I want to be part of this. So I think uh, with respect to that, you go slow. And for beta customers, we're usually cherry picking uh, via the product team or the CSMs because they're closest to the customers and know what's right for them. Uh, but if it's if it's a if it's an event that is focused on upselling, you know, I think community becomes a great place to spread that news. So if you're trying to do anything one to many, uh, and it's a it's a news that you want to share, then um, community becomes a great source. If it's an update, you're letting them know we have this new feature, try it on like how, what Pendo does, in-app communications become great. So from my experience, what I've learned is that every um, ev every type of request or suggestion uses a different channel um, and, and maybe omnichannel becomes a little bit of a bombarding way in this case, because if you're trying to update the customer, you do it uh, in an app and then you do it in a newsletter, you do it in the community and then it just becomes like, whoa, like it's too much, you know, you're telling me yeah. seven times, yeah. Yeah, that's such a hard balance because my view is opposite because we have so many customers that don't like, they, yeah. they literally tell me, don't email me, I hate it. Mm. Right. We like Slack. And they're like, okay, so we'll <laughs> use Slack. And then some are like, we don't use Slack or email. We just don't talk to people. And you're like, okay, so yeah. do we say prayers? Like, how do we tell you when something's about to change? <laughs> Smoke signals? <laughs> to mind reading <laughs> exactly and some just want to talk to their csm so do you have um for alex for, for your company do you have any in-app type product um in-app tool like pindo 
Uh, they are actually in final stages of rolling it out. Yeah. Yeah. We, so. we at, at EasyBit, we, our product marketer is looking at app queues. So okay. that's another, another tool. Um, we, she looked at Pando as well, but I think app queues were more suited to our needs. Yeah. Um, but before um, we did, well, before this has been rolled out, I actually did something in the app, which you guys will probably like to hear about. It's to do with NPS surveys. It's more of a survey tool. So it is still an app, but it is really just um, a, a way to, to just collect feedback. So we, we ran a, a trial for a couple of months um, about the invoicing screen on our software. And we got like tremendous amounts of, of, of responses. Um, I know it's a balance of, of, you know, it's a balance between not annoying the customer too much as they're working in the software and actually getting good feedback from our product team. But I think the positive, um, the actual responses, the number of respons responses is a positive that outweighs the, the few that go, stop bugging me. <laughs> well, like, that means you're doing it at the right time. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. And um, yeah, we, I think it's, it, I can't even remember the numbers, but it was like 500% more than email responses. Um, re yeah, the response rate had, had like wow. more than, yeah, just because everyone's in the software, not everyone's checking emails all the time. And yeah. our user base is so diverse from from um, the decision maker to just the nurse or the receptionist. So it's, um, yeah, and, and this tool helps with this segment uh, of that. And Which tool did you use, if you don't mind me asking? Use, uh, AppQ, uh, so, sorry, Refiner. Okay. Yeah, Refiner, they're a uh, they're really good um, company. I think they were, um, they were starting up as we as we were doing so they're always building and always improving and we, we like that and I think that the CEO is, is the support person as well um <laughs> and or, or he puts his name there so it seems, <laughs> he wrote, and he responds real quick and it's just a good tool to for anyone who's wanting to do anything in app just to get started with it's really easy to use um and we initially wanted it for NPS uh but then we ended up doing the invoice survey instead um but you can ask any question um yeah so that's that's one that i recommend that's really brand nice advocacy idea. there for a final <laughs> and you're you're yeah and you're really lucky if customers are giving you positive feedback when you're simultaneously asking them to pay their bills because that doesn't always happen at the same time yeah i mean it's it's feedback uh good or bad it doesn't matter like you know in custom marketing we just want feedback right yes um good or bad i think we'll cover that uh later in in in, in the panel but as long as you're getting feedback and responses, that's that's the most important part. That's our job. Uh, and then the how it gets funneled through is after. We'll, we'll exactly. Talk about that later. Here's the information. <laughs> Just do something with it. Yeah, do something with it. Improve. Exactly. Do better. Oh, good job. <laughs> cool. So um, yeah, that leads on to the next question. Um, the cu customer obsessed approach to upselling. Um, how, how do you focus on the existing customer base, uh, or improve adoption, uh, make them sticky, uh, and eventually upsell with confidence? Kanishka, would you like to start with yeah, that one? Absolutely. Um, and as part of you know what we do for our customers, eventually the goal is to increase the share of wallet, right? And we're all aware that in terms of KPIs, um, just getting the customer or prospect to be a customer, that takes the longest period of time because the sales cycle is long, you know, no matter how long it is, it's it's not two days ever, right? So you're trying to get the customer yeah. um, to or prospect to be a customer. So if you identify what's the easiest approach to getting more revenue is really increasing the share of wallet of the existing customer. And so upsell, even in Zscaler, upsell becomes a huge part of what we do because we're focused on existing customer, whether it is keeping them happy and keeping them um, or keeping them as a customer, making them sticky. And it's not a one team process. It's everybody who's customer facing is part of this uh, strategy for upsell. But as part of product marketing or customer marketing in case in the case of Zscaler, we're all developing a program to make sure that the customer is happy, not, you know, and finding that balance about, about 
you're getting seven emails per day versus like one email that really has value. Um, so I can tell you from Zscaler point of view, we, we go through a full program on like, what are we going to do in the next couple of quarters that will help this customer reach their ultimate goal with Zscaler. Um, we're also coordinating the CSMs because they have this sort of maturity model where the customer starts at some point, And then we have an ideal goal as to where that customer should be. And if you are breaking them down by let's say the size of the company or uh, the vertical they belong to, then everybody has a different life, life cycle to reach that maturity model, to reach the maturity process in the maturity model. Um, so the program essentially is helping customers interact with more than the CSM team, right? So whether it's customer marketing, product marketers, um, or technology to folks on our side who are constantly talking to customer and to do it in a scalable way. We're not trying to do a one-on-one -on -one approach. So we, we run constant webinars. I mean, just to give you ideas on what we're doing with our existing customers, we do webinars that really are focused not on the product, but like industry knowledge. Um, and it, I mean, every time I try to build a program like this, I'm always thinking about not how to use a software, but like, how can I improve my career and be awesome at my company, right? And that's the that's how um, we engage with the customer. Like, how can you be a rock star in your company? And that always sells because everyone wants to do well and and um, and and be amazing at their jobs. Um, so we're trying to get them to be more engaged, not just with us, but like showcase ourselves in the industry as well. Um, so getting the customers to speak in these webinars are a big. Uh, wins, they're big wins because that means that they're not they're engaged in Z, with Zscaler, but they're also trying to shine within the industry. So, for upsells, really, like we're trying to build programs for the next couple of quarters uh, and see whether we have to run webinars, whether we do these roundtables in smaller settings uh, where customers can talk to each other and you know talk about their grievances. Uh, whether it's they, they usually don't talk you know, grievances about Zscaler, but then generally they're like, because they're using so many tools and they use tools that are very overlapping uh, in the sense. So, uh, but we host these uh, meetings. And so then we gain knowledge from what they want, what their ambitions are with, within the company. And it's a great way to know the customer at a personal level without having to do it at a one-on-one -on -one, um, level. Yeah. You know, totally. you, yeah. you mentioned the maturity model and I've, been a part of companies who have used maturity models in the past as a prospecting tool. Um, it can be really challenging to do for your install base. How yeah. do you, who owns that? Who starts that process and how, I'm going a little off script here, but I think it's a really, really valuable thing. For, it kind of goes back to, so you have the customer journey and then when the customer journey ends, you have the maturity model and they kind right. of sort of overlap where do you even begin with that? That's yeah, right. I like to know yeah. that too. Yeah. <laughs> They're amazing. Appropriate. <laughs> You're, that's appropriate. Where do you begin, right? Because we're also within the organization trying to not step on each other's toes. Like where does the customer journey end and where does the customer marketing, customer um, uh, maturity model begin? We uh, are trying to really collaborate a lot with the customer success team because we're really like, I think in typically in my previous organizations, I've seen that the customer success team and the marketing team, they're, they're almost like two different uh, divisions mm -hmm. within the company. They're a customer and then bam, marketing's out, right? And then customer success takes over. The Even the pre-sales team, for all you know, is out because- Don't let the door it, hit you signed. on the way out. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> they've signed the deal now. Job it's not on leave. Yeah. <laughs> no. Why so many of us sit in CSM works? I sit in marketing, but a lot of customer marketers sit in customer success or services. Yeah, that's- I haven't seen that our mark, customer marketing currently sits in marketing itself, but we definitely, I mean, it's irrelevant because we do, we definitely coordinate a whole bunch with the customer success team. And we follow the maturity model of the customer success team right now, because they, you know, uh, typically a customer starts with one product or like a piece of the product, and then we can either upsell or cross sell more things to them. And so the maturity model is built based on that. Uh, what, where? If, you if you're spending $10,000 with us right now, that's one piece of the product, but how can we take you to the, to the level where you know, you're spending a million dollars with us? And, um, and I'm just spinning out numbers here, but can be anything, right? It's like 10X proportion of what you're spending right now. Uh, so, 
so having said that, um, customer marketers, and we show that to the customer, like you're here today and it's not about the money, it's about the value we will bring to you. Uh, you're here today and this is the value you're getting from your current contract, but if you, we can slowly take you there where the value is so high, you wouldn't care how much you're paying, right? So, um, and that I think is a very transparent, open process with the customer, the buyer, uh, right. where we're showing them how we can get there um, with our current product. Yeah, and 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 your team, Kanishka, would would or the product team would set the the level and the tiers. Um, um, so the customer marketing team typically sets where they okay. should go, but we, uh, my team, the product marketing team, definitely supports it with respect to content. Right, we're spread across the customer journey and the uh, the customer maturity process because our content and our programs that the product marketing team develops is used across the board, which is why to me sitting in product marketing, I don't differentiate between pre-sales and post-sales because even after post-sales, there's so much more we can do with them um, than you know after they sign. And this is, this is to me like something that I've learned in Zscaler. We do, I think that we do it really well. Uh, it's a very collaborative process here. So um, you know, it's, it's not that marketing is just sitting in the pre-sales part where once you're signed, we're out of the picture. No, we're not. Product marketing is definitely looking at the funnel even after the customer has signed because we're looking at many ways to upsell to existing customer base. Yeah. Alex, have you got anything to add about upselling with, with confidence? <laughs> my mind is spinning but upselling with confidence was not where it went um I think upsell <laughs> also depends on how your team's laid out right so in some circumstances all of your upsell sits with the original account team and that's mm. more relationship-based upsell in other circumstances your CS team is comped on your upsell right um so it kind of depends on who your thought partner is in that um, I can say in my role today, it straddles um, new products, sits with the account team, upsell sits with a different group. But right. on the flip side of that is cross sell, which we haven't even talked about, right? And, and that's where I think Kanishka, to your point on having someone who understands the entire journey, the entire life cycle of the customer from prospect through to, to when they're buying more product, um, not differentiating between pre and post is 100% accurate because as you're cross-selling products, your customers are looking at that new product as a new person. And in some circumstances, they're a new persona too, which is right. all kinds of fun, right? Um, Kim, you probably see this a lot, right? You know, you go, you go into an office, maybe they have mm -hmm. one or two vets, maybe three nurses, or maybe yeah. they're just like one vet, one nurse, office person or maybe they don't even have someone at the desk and then as as their practice grows it's like okay now all of a sudden we have a completely different person that we're talking to who's not a doctor not a nurse but they might be an unbelievable office manager or they might be the person that's dealing with just invoicing and their experience with the product and the value that they can derive from the product is going to be so much different and probably so different. bigger scaled than what a vet or what a nurse or so on and so forth would see. So I think part of it is, are you upselling or are you cross-selling? And then are you upselling to the same person or are you upselling to a group as the product scales and people are adopting more of the product? Um, I kind of went off script a little bit there, but- No, no, that's cool. It's definitely, um, it's, it's definitely circumstantial. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a really good point. Because in, in our, in our um, company, with upselling within the software, it's like turning on integrations, like with partners, hence why we're very closely to, um, to push that, especially partner partnerships that would drive both revenue, for, revenue for both on both sides. Uh, but it really depends um, on, on who makes that call. So for us, usually it's still the decision maker, even though it impacts every other user as well and makes their workflow better, for example. Yeah. Um, this leads on to the, the, the question, because you bring up segments and personas. Um, do, do you have a clear uh, segmentation and uh, buyer persona or user persona approach? Can you share your nodding? <laughs> well, you know, I, I want to say, put that in, your, in the chat below. Do you, <laughs> as the audience, really? Yeah. If you do have you? a way to do it, give us all of your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, no, um, identifying personas, right? That's, is that the question you're trying to ask? Like, what do we know who the persona we're talking to? Yeah, what, what, uh, how do you manage the, the persona? Like, do you even have, do you have personas created? And do you, how closely do you tie that into your content and, and how you talk to? Yeah, yeah, and, and this comes to, yeah, absolutely. It comes to the, what do we do after the customer journey? Because I think when we do, do the target market analysis or analysis of um, who your target persona is, generally we're very clear on who the buyer is. And so what's the message that goes to the buyer? Whereas in the post, um, you know, once they're a customer, we need to engage with the actual admins of the tool or the mm. people who use the tool. Um, and that's an easy, I wouldn't say easy, but like that's a straightforward way to get to uh, more upsells because if they're happy with the product, hopefully they'll tell it to their leaders and managers and I, you know, yeah. our voice is heard internally. And um, then there's a champion within the company that really helps us. So in terms of personas, uh, Typically, what I've done is try to go after the people who are using the product. And we've spoken uh, about Endo a little bit, and that has helped really see who engages most with the product. And, uh, you know, a champion, maybe only the person who knows enough about the product has, uh, you know, trained people internally, but who is actually using the product? How much time have they spent on, um, uh, on that product? And I know that Gainsight had, had a thing like this in the past where, you know, their CSMs would call out. Uh, people in the organization that they're talking to by saying that, hey, this person's been on grain site for like 15 hours in the last week. Um, are, you know, is their account turning red or like what's what's up with that person? So it's a great way to find out, you know, who's in your tool a lot and that whether that persona fits who you're trying to sell uh, to. Yeah. And then, you know, you're, you're engaging or building content for people like that who are on the tool a whole lot and then engage with, whether it's in-app, whether it's newsletters, you send something a little bit, you know, extra to them. I'm so glad yeah, you mentioned I mean, with... Gainsight because I was only <laughs> shouting out Pendo and I have a lot of friends at Gainsight who would not be happy with me if they knew that we didn't talk about Gainsight in this context at all. So I'm so glad you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, just off the question, do you guys use Gainsight at all as part of customer marketing or is that just um, the CSM team? We I don't, do not we don't use, use Gainsight. No. Gainsight's awesome. Awesome, yeah. awesome, awesome, awesome. <laughs> I've been to their for events. Those in the, for those who don't know Gainsight, uh, what is Gainsight? Is it a C CRM tool or a ticket ticketing tool? Kanishka, I'm going to let you take it because <laughs> yeah, so I haven't I, used it enough. I have used Gainsight because I think I did, I, I'm not sure I mentioned in my introduction, I was a customer success manager before I moved to product marketing. Um, it's it's a great tool for everything customer success that it brings together. Uh -huh. it, it, it combines with the CRM. We used to use Salesforce at the time. So it combines with your existing CRM to bring all the value that you need about a certain customer. So whether it's the health of the customer, what's the engagement uh, your customer has on your tool uh, today, and then um, a great way for CSMs to engage with existing customers and then record everything that they've done um, uh, right. on that platform yeah i mean there's a bunch of tools customer marketing customer yeah. success can use uh, but i know that we all rely on excel a whole lot <laughs> when you don't disagree it's horrendous <laughs> it's so bad we were we didn't even get into it i got into this in the last panel i did for the customer <laughs> marketing summit back in the spring but customer data is like the single hardest thing to collect yes um however gainsight is awesome Awesome, awesome, awesome. Can't say enough great things about it, but it's expensive and you need to have a large team to maintain it. The cool thing about Gainsight, in my view, is they created, they defined, they established CSM as a true role, right? Like they established customer success. Awesome content, awesome events. Shout out to my good friend, Lauren Ulrich, who used to run their events for Europe. Um, but there are other great tools out there. We use a product called Client Success, which is like a very fun confusion when I am on a call and I say to people, well, I'll talk to Client Success. And they're like, you mean the CSMs? And I'm like, no, I mean like the system. Like I'll log in and do some searching <laughs> in there. And they're like, it's called that? I'm like, yeah, it's probably not great branding, but it's awesome. It's my source of truth for everything. It sits on top of Salesforce. 
Um, you can pull reports, you can identify your champions, you can identify who's using it. Um, you can do some targeted emailing because that's another thing that's like really important. It depends on, and we're talking SaaS, right? But it depends mm -hmm. on where you put your upsell, your renewal dates. It, like, where are you doing your invoicing? Who's doing your invoicing? How are you doing your invoicing? And any kind of customer success platform, if it doesn't all sit in Salesforce or Microsoft Dynamics or whatever other HubSpot has a version of it too, um, it's kind of hard to schedule those upsell nurtures Absolutely. and conversations with the right lead up if you aren't using the right source of truth. Because listen, we can all sit here and pretend like everyone listening in has a single source of truth. And that would make all of us liars because every company has a lot of different systems. <laughs> I was thinking that like completely because we, we don't even have something like Gainsight to, 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 to house, uh, you know, every, everything, anything from customer sentiment. Um, we all use different tools. Uh, Excel is they're trying to achieve. Um, and try to bring people on the journey with us. And as we've got about 60,000 users uh, that we haven't really grouped, um, like marketing hasn't really grouped and separated as yet. So that's like the next thing we'll be doing and we'll probably have the help with, with the in-app tool. Um, but the first step for, for anyone starting out would, would be to create those personas and do interviews with and, and speak to the customer about their pain points um, to put that together so you can have a holistic view. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. The other thing I'll say on personas too, and I'm sure you've both seen this, is this last quarter I've been spending a lot of time doing customer interviews on kind of like what is your new biggest priority? And the one thing that I've seen pretty consistently is COVID shifted priorities for people. COVID mm -hmm. shifted, you know, Roblox is a customer of ours and you talk to Roblox and they say oh we had a lot more users playing video games during disparate times um, with kids being home right and parents kids not being out as much and more users than they had previously so Kim to your point on personas I'm sure you've seen this in your business right like I so in the states and other countries as well everybody got a new pet in the pandemic yeah. um and what does that do for vets right they can't have people coming into the office for checkups and sick visits so now you're doing even more online um which probably grew your community and probably grew your user base and probably grew your traffic right all of those things that happened organically but people's personas have changed because people's goals have changed and i don't know if this is an experience that you all are seeing and please i encourage you to leave this in the chat as well but for us what we've seen is it doesn't really matter what industry people are in mm -hmm. goals have changed everywhere priorities have changed everywhere and they're not really going back anytime soon because they're doing more with less they're optimizing more um so i think that also you constantly have to look at your personas because they're going to continuously yeah. shift kind of like the sunlight behind me that's now gone <laughs> <laughs> it's dark when we started when we started there was, it was light and now it's dark exactly you would never know that Kanishka and i are like on the same easy. coast <laughs> <laughs> that's true so we I think we've got time for one last question about the customer feedback itself. Um, like how do we create efficient feedback at scale um, and, and what we do with, with handling ne negative feedback and, and how we can loop it back into the product roadmap. Um, I, I could start with this one. Um, I was going to say, create, you have the yeah. organic community. You start because I, I, I want to know how you scale that feedback with 60,000 users. So with the, with the actual feedback loop that we create, we don't pull in, um, we haven't had a system to pull in individual feedback uh, in, a, in a holistic view from the community itself, but we do, we do so by way of the NPS surveys and those, those tools that we use in app. Um, but then we do set guidelines and, and a process of what happens if it's a detractor, a passive or a promoter. Um, 
so that that's very important to to follow up after the after you've got that feedback through um, and we've also created a, a dashboard with using uh, using the MPS survey results um, and we're we, we're using the power of BI, but there are a lot of tools out there that are probably uh, come with any software that you use to collect MPS scores and, and feedback. Mm -hmm. And from there, you can do word mapping um, and, and, and anything that, that there is a theme that's going on in, in that feedback and, and then bring it to the product team, for example. And for us, it's usually the product team that, that would benefit most from from any sort of feedback because it's always about the, you well we ask because we ask how would likely would you be to recommend easy bit um, and usually it's about the product uh, whether it's a feature or, or functionality um, or, or, or if the performance is not so good the feedback uh, the feedback needs to go to the product team um, so we're still still building on closing the the loop to the product team but we do have an efficient loop already uh, by actioning and doing by doing a follow up with with dependent on the scores, yeah. Very cool. Who maintains the Power BI? Does marketing maintain that? No, we have a, a business analyst that that okay. maintains that. Yeah, um, amongst other things, but yes, yeah, so we collaborate with with him, and he just builds. He pulls in all the data that's needed, and then and then we uh, we we tell him what 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 we want showing. But can I ask you a follow-up question on the feedback? Like, if it's not yes. product feedback, what else are, are the customers talking about? Support. Um, so we, I created four different theme categories, so to speak. So after they ask, their, how likely are you to recommend EasyBit? There would be four categories to, to pick from because after analyzing the open feedback, I realized there's actually really four. So one is support. So that's customer support. Um, it could be also to do with their onboarding. So that falls on the support. And then there's easy bit features. So that features functionality, there's site performance. And what is the last one? Um, ah, no, actually I can't recall what the last one was. There's one more and then there's other. So it's just putting them into categories and then making it easier to, to wrap up um, for the product team. The fourth one will come to me. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for answering that. Because um, yeah, typically in the feedback loop, it is about the product and it is about, you know, what their experience on the product is. Um, it's really hard to scale, honestly. Like it's, we have a lot of users and it's very difficult to gather all the things and then also help prioritize. And speaking of Excel from earlier, what we used to do in my previous organization also is collect all that information, like have a representative from every department, like CSNs to discuss with each other and then have, you know, like a report of 10 things that they want to see in the next six months. And, um, you know, support would, get this information from all the emails that they get about the product. And then those are 10 things that we need to consider. And the consolidation happens where product marketing, customer marketing, and the product team would sit together, review these 40, 50 features and say, no, mm. from a messaging point of view, from the company or market point of view, can we take these you know, top five things and then let the product team prioritize based on you know, resources and everything else that they do? Because it's not only important to service your existing customers and take their feedback. Um, but it's also important to hear what prospects have to say because you want to expand that business as well. Um, and you know, one of the courses that I took a few years ago did talk about um, how listening to your existing customers is almost like only listening to person who shouts a lot. And that's why you're doing that person's job. But you also have to listen to people who are not as loud as you know this person. So doing that market research in terms of not just customers, but also your prospects really helps you expand as a business because then 
you are not only focusing on what people want today, but also what people are looking for in your product that's not available. And, and one of the ways that we used to do that is win-loss analysis. And I know I'm you just- took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. It really helps. And, and I think, you know, as is life, right? Uh, losses teach you a lot more than wins do. And so definitely a part of what we do as part of product marketing and customer marketing, it's not just about the customer, but also prospects. Eventually your goal is to expand your business. Yeah. Win-loss analysis can be very humbling experiences. <laughs> <laughs> I will say to another but, panel on this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. lit- literally. But they're gold. Yeah. They're gold. <laughs> they're, for, I find as a marketer, they're gold because they, you so quickly learn if you're positioning something wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and you so quickly learn what the analysts are saying about you a lot of times. Um, but, you know, going back to the feedback loop, CSMs, if, if we're talking about scale, right, outside of surveys and things like that, um, CSM feedback is invaluable. Mm-hmm. Um, like, this is going to sound so trivial, but we talked about segmenting NPS detractors, right? Mm-hmm. But look at your support tickets. What is what are people complaining about in support tickets? Where are their most requested feature requests? It's very easy to get hung up on the five feature requests from your largest customer. Totally. Reevaluating engineering. But does that scale your business? Is that because at the end of the day, yes, cash is king, but are you going to make more money? Or it sounds so terrible, but are you going to grow your business with your largest customer now? Or are you going to grow your business by looking at, say your average sale is $15,000 a year, right? What are the, why are people only spending $5,000 a year? What's stopping them from spending six, seven, eight versus looking at the customer who's spending $50,000 a year and probably not going to spend much more. Um, so support tickets are really, really good for that. And then yeah. some of that one-to-many communication can also give you some of that feedback. Um, I'll leave you with one last thing on the, uh, and I should have mentioned this in the install bait, it, the upsell conversation, but there's a company mm-hmm. called Catchpoint. They're based in New York. Um, did some partnering with them, but also we sat down and just kind of had like a brain trust day. We were like happening. This was pre-pandemic when we could meet in the office and it was like really fun to bring in lunch and, you know, have a day, but they took their entire customer base and split them in a quadrant. And it was like top left were their largest customers who probably weren't going to spend a lot more money. Top right were, that was where they wanted to focus. And those were, I don't even know how many customers they have. Say they have 200 customers. Those were like 30 to 50 accounts where they said, we are underservicing them. And if we just paid a little bit more attention, we, it wasn't even attached to money. It was attached to stickiness. How do we give them a better experience with our platform? Um, and they saw amazing results. And it wasn't even, fi- I mean, the financial results come if your customers like you, right? Like that's just a given. But what mm. they saw was an increase in NPS, an increase in retention, an increase in just overall customer satisfaction because they were able to focus on customers that were like happy, but what were the features that were going to change the game for their customer experience versus the features that are nice to have for your already most loyal customers. And I know everyone's loyal customers, their ears are probably burning because they feel like they're going to be ignored, but we're not ignoring you. We're just telling you that if we improve what we're the best at, it's going to be that much better of an experience for you and your team. And it's going to be upgradable. (laughs) Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. Writing notes is, uh, (laughs) as you were talking about. (laughs) Cool. And the last one is about handling negative customer feedback. Um, Kanisha, would you like to share on how you utilize negative feedback in a product um, yeah. product aspect? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, you, you take a step back and say, this is constructive feedback. Um, and as I suggested earlier, you know, it's it's not just about doing what, what's required right now, but also 
you know, so most of the negative feedback is around, you don't have this. So I'm not going to upgrade mm. to your next level or, you know, your competitor ha does this better. Well, we're getting there or, you know, there's, there's, we're, we're probably not headed in that direction because that's one thing to also note with existing customers is that you're also trying to be honest with, you know, that's not the direction we want to head, take our company because that's, you know, one of the things that we always talk about in Zscale is also identity management. And there's a lot of companies that do it really, really well. Um, and we're not getting into that space. So when we talk about cybersecurity, it's just a whole spectrum of things that you can do. Um, and I faced this even in previous roles where they ask, can you do this? And, and you just have to be honest with that customer that we're not headed in that direction, you know, uh, and we can partner obviously with a whole bunch of companies that do something similar. Um, but in terms of taking that negative feedback, take a step back and say, this is just constructive criticism about the product, about the process. And, um, it, uh, you know, a lot of it is operational as well. You take that feedback, brainstorm as a team. Um, if, if this is, something that you do or not. Actually, I have a great example. This is from years ago. I used to work at Fisher Price owned by Mattel. Um, and it, it was such a fun place to work because it's all about toys. And what you do every day as part of market research is just watch from behind a screen what kids are doing with the toys. And it, it is a lot of negative criticism on the product because they, some of them would not touch the toy that you developed, you know, expecting a four-year-old to play with it. And so it was never taken personally. It's more about what can we do next so that toy is attractive compared to everything else in the room, right? So um, whether it's the colors, whether it's um, something that makes sound, you just have to understand what a four-year-old wants to uh, engage with and then stick to that and take, take that to the next level. So I think of that a whole lot when we receive negative criticism because it's about maybe they don't understand that this is to be used in a certain way whether it's documentation, showing demo videos, um, whatever helps the case with that customer, right? So uh, th that's how I look at it. It's it's not always negative. It's about whether there's a miscommunication or um, it's not meant to be used in a certain way. Yeah, I would that say is. acknowledge it. Yeah, acknowledge it. Maybe do a bit more research and then respond appropriately. It's like thank you uh, for your for your feedback because it's their point of view. Yeah, um, it's not us to change it. Um, but then it's this for us to, to say, okay, this is what we're going to do um, yeah. to fix this or, or improve whether or not and how long uh, that would take. That's another story. But as long as you acknowledge it, um, I think people would just want to be heard sometimes. Yeah. You know, the Fisher price analogy is such a good one. And the reason I say that is because if a four-year-old tells you that they don't like something, you're not offended. You <laughs> ask them why, and then you move on. Yeah. So if we all, I might've just given you a new tagline or like a new phrase, catchphrase to use in a meeting, but if we all approach product feedback as it's coming from a four-year-old, not a big customer or an engineer or a user, we probably would take things a lot less personally. And you probably would take it from, because the, th the one thing about kids that I appreciate is they're very literal and they see things for exactly what they are and they give you feedback with zero filter. And we've all become so filtered that maybe that's the best way, but maybe that's the best way to ask the question. Like if I were to really simplify this, what don't you like and why? Yeah. And you know, sometimes a kid doesn't like a toy and you're like, well, tough, nothing's gonna change. And other times they don't like a toy and you're like, you make a very good point. Let's choose a different one. Yep. And if you approach it that way, it's a little easier probably to make product decisions, right? Absolutely. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> the tip for feedback, treat it like it came from a four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Your feelings won't be as hurt, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I think I think that's that's it's, it's about time to to wrap up now. I mean, we I think we've gone a little bit over time, but it's just so much to learn. Um, like I said, I was taking notes. Um, but I think this will all be recorded anyway and and be shared out to, to everyone uh, to, to review in your own time. Um, and if anyone wants to get in touch with us direct, directly, you can find us through LinkedIn um, and carry on the conversation there. And I'll definitely be carrying it on with you guys. <laughs> so Thank good meeting you. you. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. This was such a great time. Thank you all and hope to chat with everyone uh, in the chat later today. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Kanishka. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>